And welcome everybody to Nick's Nonfiction, a learning environment we have set up here, a monthly nonfiction. You're taking facts home every single month where young struggling at life comic Nick Muniz is here to debrief the newest and hottest book, give you a newer and better outlook on life to transcend and be the best form of yourself on this earth. And this month, we have Matthew Walker's Why We Sleep, unlocking the power of sleep and dreams. You are going to be leaving this show sleeping on cloud nine like a baby. You are going to reach out to me, that is, if you haven't fallen asleep by the time you tried to start to type something, and tell me how well you are sleeping by the information in this book. Ladies and gentlemen, we have a treat for you on this month's Nick's Nonfiction. Welcome back, newcomers, old comers, all comers. This is my monthly show, Nick's Nonfiction, hosted by Nick Muniz. We have a great book lined up and so much to touch upon as this show is growing. We have a community. It's the size of a small tribe tuning in. Like, it's something special going on, people. This is a kindling that's only getting bigger. There's all kinds of special news coming in. It's the best time of the year. Getting that sun in. Getting out of the freaking apartment. The city is coming back to life. You wouldn't believe it. So much to touch upon. So last show was a real fun one. We were talking about, it was March. Remember cold gray March? Less than 20 days ago. March, we were talking about bullshit jobs. You get in a rut in those uh, colder months, but we're breaking out here. And we touched upon some serious topics in that show. We went deep. And this show is going to go deeper than that. We're submarines, but we're also rocket ships. This month, we're going back to the moon. We had outliers reaching new goals. And now we're going to be sleeping like babies to fuel us to get to those next ones. You don't even know what's coming. So as my duty as a host, I have to tell you, we're going to be covering today how to improve your sleep, your brain on and off the drug that is sleep. Talking about naps. I know we got a lot of nappers out there. Holla at the nappers. We're talking about sleep across the entire lifespan because it changes. Sleeping like a baby to sleeping like a dead rock at the end of your life. We're covering the entire apex dreams who wants to know how to lucid dream that's why i bought this book in the first place we're going over that today rem sleep dreaming and creativity overall sleep hygiene and then if you want to skip ahead look below timestamps. we have matthew's 12 suggestions for a better night's sleep so what is probably going to be two hours can be condensed into probably two minutes at the end of the show skip around that's what this is made for it's all broken down into fun times little ethanol, little THC involved. We'll be going over all of that in today's show, so you're going to want to stick around for the whole thing. Helpful information about sleep is coming at you hot. Last show, yeah, it was definitely a fun one. It was a more serious one, but it was a fun one. And now we have facts, but who says facts can't be fun? Welcome to Nick's Nonfiction. I'm only breaking this book down into four parts, so I'm confident. I know I said last show that it was going to be a shorter show, but I'm confident that this time it is actually going to be shorter. It was a 16-chapter book. It's going to be going over and about the author in due time. My ladies, <laughs> my lady, tips for Dora, and my dudes, it's going to be a good show. And it's been a good month. I hope everybody made it through that march. Uh, I had a ski trip to look forward to unexplainable fun man if you have a group of friends that you love stay in touch with them even if it puts you in debt to go see them <laughs> that's what life is about but if you go broke i'm by no means taking any financial responsibility for you <laughs> and dude it's the birthday of comedy april fool's day it's just such a good time of year i know everybody's feeling that you know the haircuts get shorter the short skirts get even shorter there's nothing not to love about it people are getting outside their homes I never saw this many dogs in a city. Who knew that you could have a dog? <laughs> Who would want to have a dog and have to walk it three times a day and come home in the middle of the day and in the middle of a metropolitan? But you see these people at 6 p.m. It's like an Alaskan dog race, the amount of people that are outside running with their dogs. I'm going to drop some truth on your domes right now, and it's a mean truth bomb, but here it comes. You're not supposed to run with your dogs. Dogs are sprinting animals. Unless you have a greyhound or a very large hound, they are by no means able to keep up with a human because humans are able to sweat 
That's why we're able to tire out elks or larger animals to eat oxen. That's how the Native Americans do it. It's because we could sweat, but dogs have to pant. And if you ever look at a dog when it's running, they have their beak, their beak, their muzzle closed, and they're just looking around like, this is kind of fun, but I can't breathe. So don't run with your dogs. Also, it hurts their paws because we have cement. Hey, see, my rants get me a little down sometimes when I'm trying to be happy about the weather. <laughs> so treat your dogs right and I won't have to do this standing up for my dogs out there I do for my dogs loving it and my birthday is next month <laughs> not that that matters you know every year you get older you realize this is just a stupid day maybe I'll just get a Bud Light tall boy and go home at night people stop realizing I could just see a couple years into the future <laughs> for the month of May we're going to be going over Maury Rothbard's Anatomy of the State and I ordered this book over Amazon through the mail, and <laughs> it came in a tiny package, like an earring package, and I'm like, all right, who's getting Sephora on my credit card? And I opened the package, and it's a pamphlet. So we're going to be going over Anatomy of the State. It's basically a 30-page book, so if this is the month that you want to start reading along, this is going to be a real easy one. And then for my birth month, <laughs> I'll milk it while I'm still young. I'm turning 23. Ooh, so old. <laughs> It'll be an easier read for me then, for whatever that's worth. But as the weather gets warmer, there's a lot more mics to do. People start inviting you to more shows the more you're out, and shit gets rolling. All these comics with their fucking seasonal depression. We gotta power through that winter. That's why New York and L.A. are killing so hard, because L.A. doesn't have winter. And New York, you just live inside for your entire 40 years of however long you're gonna spend in New York. <laughs> Denver's popping off, and this podcast is about to, too, with Anatomy of the State next month. Maury Rothbard, he's just an economist, high IQ Jew. That's a redundant statement, I would guess. But this guy was integral in helping rebuild the economy after the 1930s Great Depression and helped found the, like the, what is it, Chicago School of Economy. That's a real shot in the dark, but we got Google nowadays, so... <laughs> I'm admitting I'm inferior to Google's search algorithm. Sin me. So we're going deep again. Remember the ebb and flow of the show? Next month for May is going to be deep. We're going to be disproving our current political system. Hang with me. And showing that the market is really the people's will, not democracy. You see in the news now, not going to get political here, you see in the news now, democracy is supposed to be this word linked with good in your brain. So you hear, this is a threat to our democracy. If you've ever seen that Sinclair broadcast video, and you're supposed to go, oh no, my voting rights, my democracy. Yeah, we're setting up democracy in the Middle East. <laughs> So just watch out for that buzzword these upcoming months in the media while they're looking for presidential candidates. And this whack job Beto O'Rourke is just some reason the chosen one out of nowhere by the DNC who screwed over. <laughs> they're about to screw over Bernie two elections in a row. They're just going to do it until he dies. I'm sure he'll run again in 2024 and everybody wants him in there. <laughs> no more politics. No more. Until next month. <laughs> I'll save it. Whoever has their finger on the pulse of Washington, come check along with me in May. And before you count yourself out for May, let me just defend my statement I was talking about. The claim is the book is disproving how politics and democracy is the people's will and shows how the market is people's will. So let me explain this real quick. You see these protests in the media too, and on Instagram are really popular. It's a real weird time. You get more likes if you post a picture of yourself at the Women's March or hashtag Women's Equality Day we just had in March or whatever that shit just started. Yeah, now they need a day. <laughs> we are the 1% in America. We are wealthier than every other single nation, and we're just scrubbing at we're a little bit more oppressed <laughs> Harry shit oh I gotta plug it real quick now Harry shit I posted a, a meme referencing that I'll post it in while I talk over it right now hit up YouTube Nick's nonfiction YouTube it was saying how 85% of suicide deaths in America are by white males how men pay 15% more for car insurance Asian Americans are the highest earning per capita race so just like 
real facts I was posting and a little lull to go along with it. Sorry, audio listeners, you're going to be losing out on this one a little bit. Point being how these protests and marches are cool to do for Instagram, but what would really be stronger and better for quote-unquote democracy, but the market is really what represents the people. So what would really be better for the people are boycotts. So if I did hashtag boycott mcdonald's until they put real meat in mcnuggets that would never gain traction because mcdonald's would just pay off twitter but you could see how if everybody just didn't buy mcnuggets for a day mcdonald's would probably put some juicy nice tenders on the menu but no we are eating pink goop every night a lot of americans (laughs) a scary amount of americans do eat mcdonald's every night so yeah boycotts would really represent America more than these stupid Instagram posts and marches where the government is able to hire counter protesters to come in and cause riots to make it look like marches need to have a government permit, even though there's nobody that violent. Bzz, 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 politics meter increasing. So that's going to be next month's <laughs> book. Definitely don't count it out. Probably will be a shorter episode because it's a shorter book. That's the month of May, Anatomy of the State, Maury Rothbard. And let's get into Why We Sleep by the British bloke, Matthew Walker. Matthew was born in Liverpool in 1972, making him 45 years of age nowadays. And he is a scientist and professor of neuroscience and psychology at Harvard and now UC Berkeley. Getting into his past a little bit, while he was that professor of psychiatry at Harvard from 2002 to 2007, and he earned his right to be a full-time professor from 02 to 04 when he was conducting a majority of the sleep studies that we'll be talking about throughout the chapters. And this is when he put his 10,000 hours in, referencing a couple months ago, checking out that backlog go listen to some other episodes if you need more entertainment at this point malcolm gladwell's outliers this is when matthew walker this month's author put in his ten thousand hours at harvard smart guy i'd say mr walker you might recognize him if you google him he's a carrot top (laughs) so that's basically why i just said you might recognize him he was on 60 minutes national geographic nova science now that was on his wikipedia the joe rogan experience that's how i learned about this guy in this book and then put it on my reading list i think he was on there like a year ago but when you're reading a book a month and you got a reading list as long as mine is it's gonna take a minute to get to this guy you ever seen that twilight zone episode where this guy where the world ends he's the only guy left and he goes to a library stacks up all his books he's gonna read for the rest of his life And then his glasses break, and he goes, It's not fair! It's not fair! Totally dramatic, but worth the 27 minute long episode to get to that one scene. That's basically my reading list, and I finally got to this guy, even though he was on the uh, Joe Rogan show (laughs) like a year and a half ago. That's some creepy stuff. (laughs) That show has like 15 million listeners per episode that's more rated than any television series for the past 50 years and the media won't acknowledge that it exists that's some shit that creeps me out (laughs) moving along matthew walker was also on npr and his home channel the bbc constantly on there that british favoritism hey i'm a american (laughs) i'm a straight white american male i need my fair share of time on the bbc that is racist against me i'm gonna go do morning radio on the bbc yeah matthew walker currently resides at the uc berkeley which has the center for human sleep science no question that he wound up there he now conducts a lot more of the studies that we're going to be talking about today also a couple other things matthew walker did in august 2016 he worked with a application company called hello it was a consumer electronics company they made this like sleep tracking device fitbit and your iphone can do that no wonder they went out of business but he was their chief scientific officer to analyze and improve sleep habits that was his job title so he got (laughs) he's got his fingers in all kind of honey holes as this author scientist professor 
hats that he wears. But even through this little gig he had with this company, he was able to analyze sleeping habits and aggregate a shitload of data. And he left there in 2017 when Hello shut down for obvious reasons I just mentioned and they didn't see coming for whatever reason. Since October 2017, Walker has been, I'll be referring to him as Walker throughout the book. Luke, I am your father. (laughs) That's Skywalker. No, I'm leaving that bit in anyway. (laughs) To give this guy a little more credit, since 2017, he is a sleep scientist at Google Life which is a research organization funded by Alphabet Inc., owners of Google and fund receivers of the Pentagon. So those guys are in it for the long haul and probably already have a supercomputer and AI telling them what to do and control this media by now. And this book, Why We Sleep, came out in late 2017, which is why he's still doing press and which is why it's super relevant and on Nick's nonfiction this April. Who's ready to get started? It only took 20 minutes, but I'm ready. Let's do this. I snuck in before we're going to be breaking this book down into four parts. The first being this thing we called sleep. Just getting to know a bit about sleep and why we do this little weird thing for a third of our life. Part two, why would you sleep? Evolutionaries talking about it. It's one of the dumbest things we do. You're totally vulnerable for six to ten hours at a time part three is a little bit about how and why we dream that's the fun stuff we're going to be talking about the chemical bath that your brain takes every single night and then part four is from sleeping pills to society transformed it's all about the type of medications that a scary amount of americans are on to get to sleep and what we can do to get to bed better in the future so let's do it this thing we call sleep part one In chapter one, to sleep, which the main point was the shorter you sleep, the shorter your lifespan is. And old Matty Walker has tons of stats and studies to prove it. You know when you're tired and your brain starts to malfunction, this is a great excuse for work. Why'd you make the mistake on that paperwork? Oh, I was so tired that day. I was just groggy in the morning. Or even when you were at a sleepover with your friends in the fifth grade and you guys are like overtired you'd call it and someone goes penis and they probably woke your parents up but it was the funniest thing in the world to try not to laugh (laughs) your brain when you're off of sleep for like 14 hours is the same as having a 0.08 bac it's basically like being drunk you got a nice buzz going on when you stay up for too long sleep is very essential and you can see if you don't get your sleep it's like being an alcoholic your whole life and you die a little bit earlier two-thirds of adults in america report to not get eight hours of sleep and that makes sense it gets harder to initiate sleep throughout your life we're going over sleep in the lifespan and as you get older being on this sleep-deprived brain just exacerbates psychiatric breaks and increases appetite so it leads to overeating which leads to not being able to sleep which leads to overeating it's a terrible vicious vortex that you get sucked into but we have all the cures here so don't go anywhere And let's really dissect one of Matthew's first points here. He spent a few too many pages talking about the old saying, I'll sleep when I'm dead. Well, you're shortening your lifespan and lessening the qualities and years that you have on this earth while you're giving yourself a sleep-deprived brain. So it really does suck. I do agree. It sucks we have to sleep for a third of our life. But, like, those are the rules of this meatbag bodies that we have to encompass in this game that we play. So choosing to stay up late and smoke cigarettes or whatever those old badasses and the Westerners who'd say, I'll sleep when I'm dead would say, were going against the rules of the game. And they probably had more fun playing the game, but they left the game a little bit sooner for that reason. Let me get a little more scientific for you. Alzheimer's, cancer, diabetes, and a whole slew of diseases comes with not sleeping. In the later chapters, Matthew was talking about dementia. It gets into real scary stuff, not podcastable stuff, about how your brain just like starts to shut down, forgets your identity, and all that type of creepy stuff when you don't get sleep. Like those psychiatric breaks I just mentioned, anxious panic attacks, depressive episodes, suicidal ideation, all of those toxic thoughts 
ramp up with the toxic chemicals that stack up acetane i think it was called this chemical builds up in your brain when you don't sleep and the less you sleep the harder it is to realize that you need sleep so it's like that old thing when you're at the bar and you're asking the bartender for your keys because the drunker you get the less you know you're going to be able to drive the car. You're like, oh, yeah, I could drive it better than ever right now. I drive better when I'm drunk. I've heard people say that in my lifetime. <laughs> All that be ramping up when you don't sleep. So scientists like Matthew on their speaking tours like he's been doing since 2017 are now trying to get doctors to prescribe sleep as a medicine. That's pretty cool. You could go to your doctor and instead of getting a doctor note, you get a nap note where you could just kick back in your office once a day or actually sleep in until 10 a.m. when you need to or something like that. Instead of being dragged into your cubicle at 6 to answer phones that aren't ringing at that time of day. Experience here. And we learn later in the book that opioids, which are being prescribed as sleep medicine right now, rather than just saying, hey, don't come into the office. You look like shit. You look like you aged a couple years because you haven't slept in a week. That's a fact we're going over in this book, how you literally age when you don't sleep by a couple weeks. And so the opioids that are being prescribed by Big Pharma right now, we have a chapter on this, they just knock you out and they don't actually give you the benefits and your body doesn't go through the actual circadian rhythm of sleep so you don't get any of the benefits. But damn, are you knocked out like a rock and does that feel good for a handful of hours? It's not a good way to get your body back on track though. It's a good way to keep buying these new medicines. Matthew's doing the Lord's work touring the country trying to tell doctors dude tell people to sleep <laughs> don't get them hooked on benzodiaphamines we're going over drug families today as well truly a good deed matthew is doing here and this attitude towards authors and scientists having to tour the country to talk to doctors because <laughs> you get your medical degree in 1970 and then you act like a god every day to people that trust their doctor to eat an apple every day slash 40 grams of straight up sugar <laughs> So we value doctors pretty hard in today's society. But coming up through that medical community, the grueling years of medical school, and then dealing with those high-class people that you're living in communities with, lawyers, corporate workers, finance workers, these aren't communities that value sleep. Rightfully so, if you're sleeping away, like I said, more than a third of your life that you need to, you're probably not the most productive human on the planet. But also bragging about getting three hours of sleep last night. Yeah, man, I barely got any sleep. I was like, dude, I was like up till four. Cool, you're drunk right now. <laughs> if you got in a car, you would be more likely to kill somebody else than if you were actually on a couple shots of tequila. <laughs> All those people, you're basically just bragging about being incapacitated at the moment. I hear this shit all that time <laughs> oh, we should i work at a coffee shop so everyone's like oh i don't sleep at all i drink coffee all night <laughs> and the real problem here is i i just made fun of it for a good couple minutes the real problem here is that doctors can't pinpoint why sleep is so valuable so if nobody can tell you this is why you should sleep you're gonna be like that shit is stupid i waste so much time in a coma every single day why would i do that again i'd much rather surf the internet the coolest thing that humans have ever put together collectively <laughs> the science isn't there yet to pinpoint in 140 characters everybody's attention span a tweet's worth saying this is why you need to sleep. At the end of the book, we talk about how if there was just an app that would show you a picture of your face, if you didn't sleep for two weeks, you'd be like, ugh, because we're so vain as people. You would, <laughs> that was a good Napoleon and Dynamite. Ugh. I'm putting some dank pictures with that on YouTube. <laughs> if you could just have that app and doctors could actually pinpoint why sleep is so valuable, it wouldn't be so noble to brag about getting four hours of sleep and going about your life totally incapacitated and at 60 percent brain power when you could be optimized so let me shift into a topic i really like because <laughs> i have a bit about this topic one of my first bits that started working on stage the point here will be that drowsy driving accounts for forty thousand deaths a year if I had a dollar for every time. Nah, just playing. That's some serious stuff to joke around about. 
40,000 people die a year. Not to drunk driving, not to high driving myth, not to people driving incapacitated on sleep medication. Real. 40,000 deaths a year come from people being sleep deprived and hundreds of thousands of accidents. So yeah, you could lose your ability to walk because some dickhead didn't get eight hours of sleep last night and he was too busy watching Nick's nonfiction on YouTube. It's a real dangerous problem out there. Truth bomb, that's more deaths and accidents than drunk driving. But common trope here, the media's got you. <laughs> oh my god, think about this one. This just hit me. They put that wrecked, mangled car of, quote, drunk drivers outside of your high school every single year before prom to try to get you to not drunk drive. Dude, I was sober after prom and it was a rat race down to the jersey shore it was not safe and everybody was sober well not everybody but you know what i'm saying people are going to be stupid whether they're sleep deprived drunk or sober but the numbers are there's over double the amount of accidents for people driving just from not getting enough sleep than being drunk but you know it's easier to wag your finger at people who knowingly got drunk and then got behind the wheel of the car i sympathize with that <laughs> Uber's pretty damn cheap nowadays. And to slam dunk my case on drunk driving, distracted driving also has more deaths and accidents than drunk driving. So drunk driving is like the little man on the block, but it's still such a good devil to put a mangled car in front of your high school when they should put just a giant cell phone saying, you're a slave to this thing to these 16-year-olds. Yeah, I know that was such a deep point for me to make, but it's true, dude. Why are we just scaring them about drinking? Not that fear shouldn't even be the motivator at all. <laughs> and people, I think, down deep know this. That bit I would use about, especially in Colorado, dog, because people, whew, this is bad. I'm not going to call the police, but I was taking an Uber home from work and I saw a lady <laughs> next to us in traffic. She had a couple baby seats at the back. And she was hitting her G-Pen. Ooh, she was hitting marijuana, her vaporizer. But, you know, IndyCar drivers actually say they get high in order to race because it does improve your motor cortex abilities. We're going over the drug families later. But it's a totally different end of the spectrum from drug driving. And so, like I'm saying, people know this. <laughs> this mom... Come on, dude, you're a mom. Unless this was the worst person in the world, she knows that she is not lessening her driving capabilities by taking a suck of that CBD thing or whatever it was with two infants in the back seat. If that was my wife, mm, <laughs> I think I could wrangle a jury together that would say a backhand would be warranted in that situation. But I'm just saying people are doing these types of things. So people can relate because it's all about truth. And in New Jersey, we had Mothers Against Drunk Driving, which was like a political action community that all they were able to do was lobby in the rape sticker, which had 16-year-old girls identifying themselves on their vehicles past 11 at night. Great idea, guys. But what they really should have done as the grown-up Girl Scouts that they were would just be hand out espresso shots outside of third shift factory workers who really are the people that get in the most accidents because they're on pain medications, probably sleeping pills too, and they get out of their jobs at 5 a.m. when the sun is rising and their body doesn't know what the hell is going on. And that's where a majority of these crashes come statistically from. See, that's how you stomp on a joke on a podcast, but... That's also why you don't give your jokes away. <laughs> Premise being these grown-up Girl Scouts can set up their cookie stands to get people home safe rather than just lobbying laws to get them to pay fines. But you know it goes viral much better? A car full of attractive teenagers who got drunk because one dipshit decided to get drunk before driving his friends. So that's how the media wins. But we have more fun here on Nick's Nonfiction than raising our anxiety levels while watching Essie Cup yell about hatred in America or something irrelevant. <laughs> Finishing up chapter one, Matthew talked a little about dreams inspiring creativity because this is what happens through REM sleep. And every night, think about Westworld. You know, they soak those bodies in the, that white material or the matrix. They're inside those like gooey battery domes. Every single night, your brain gets soaked in this chemical bath and you enter this VR space where some people can control themselves, other people, we don't know what's happening still. What your brain is doing subconsciously is melding your past and present knowledge together in this dreaming REM sleep period, which then inspires creativity because 
best way I could try to describe this is like when you start writing bits down, if you're ever thinking about getting on stage for years, in freshman year of high school, I started a quote book of what our friend group said, just the most ridiculous stuff. <laughs> Fun to go back and read. But what you do is just filter down, keep filtering down, connecting old free writing thoughts to new premises that you think might be funny. It's just like trying to make a new web, which is creativity. You're like a spider. Like we talked, like we're about to talk about this month. They put spiders on different drugs and saw what kind of webs they spun. So when you're trying to write these bits, 99% of everything you ever write won't make it anywhere you're gonna siphon it down you might get a couple funny lines couple syllables even that's why it's about getting on like a habit of writing x amount of time a day so you could really just crunch all that shit down dude these run sheets i make for this podcast are 20 pages long at least it's nuts and your brain and it's obviously driving me crazy you got to see my first manic episode of the spring at the beginning of the show a fucking love spring here it is and every night subconsciously your brain does this for you so even when you get to rest your brain in REM sleep is taking your past and present memories and transferring it from short-term storage to long-term storage we're going to talk about a couple chapters deeper about how your short-term memory is like a little flash drive you got to plug that bitch in every single night to unload it if you actually want to put stuff into your long-term memory so not only your brain gets to take this chemical bath but your microbiome, your gut <laughs> microbiome, that's such a, sounds like a boring word. This word's going to be coming up a lot because nutrition, like I'm saying, keeps away doctors, nutrition science. It's going to be what keeps us longer in the future. And your microbiome, your gut flora is this little world of organisms that break down food and keep your gut healthy. That's where adrenaline rushes out to your limbs when you need it. It all starts in your gut. You know, you have neurons in your gut you have the things in your brain that help you think you have in your gut and your heart that's why you literally have a gut feeling or you can go with your heart you have trillions of neurons in your brain but you only have a couple hundred thousands in your heart and your gut and so when you sleep these get a total wash over as well so if you don't sleep the next day you're not gonna be able to digest food and you get chubbier and chubbier and chubbier dude i worked the third shift 5 p.m till 3 a.m and it was at a pizza place so i went home and ate pizza and i barely slept you know i was up at probably 215 i'm down at 190 and now i'm doing that bullshit keto you know do it it'll save your life i'm doing it the lifestyle route i still get on some ice cream and donuts you don't even know my game but mostly chicken and lettuce every damn night <laughs> so that's the game and i'm down to like 190 that links right back to nutrition science and your microbiome the way matthew found out about this biome stuff and how nutrition is so helpful because not a lot of people are logging their nutrition was he got to work with the nba nfl premier soccer leagues as the brit he is footballers worked with pixar animators silicon valley tech companies and government researchers of course so he has been deep we're getting some real info on today's show if you want to buy the book he says <laughs> constantly throughout it dude it's a hundred percent okay if you want to fall asleep right now i won't take offense i'll actually take it as a compliment if you fall asleep because that's what the point of this book is to try to get everybody better sleep hygiene and so that's going to bring us to the end of chapter one. Just about how sleep hygiene will lengthen and improve the quality of your life as opposed to not sleeping and not living long. So you can't sleep when you're dead. When you're dead, you're dead or wherever we go. You got to sleep while you're alive. You got to pay the piper's toll while you're here. Chapter two, something in all of our systems here we can talk about. Caffeine, jet lag, and... Haha, <laughs> I gotcha. You thought I didn't get you on the first two. Melatonin! It's in all of us. Chapter 2, Caffeine, Jet Lag, and Melatonin. <laughs> this chapter is all about how our circadian rhythm gets messed with from all these outside stimuli. Because we live in a society. So we have all these LED lights in our faces and alarm clocks that we have to wake up to. Jet lag. <laughs> we take flights places. We could travel across the globe like we've never been able to. So how does that mess up our biological clock when it took Magellan a couple years to get around the world? We could do it in a day. And so when you keep your circadian rhythm in check, 
Last chapter, we just saw how when you get to work with NBA, NFL, Premier League players, all those people, you get the best research. And Olympic record holders have their circadian rhythm synced up to whatever time zone they're going to be in to compete in, ready to go. And the best runs record holders have, world record holders, are done in early afternoon, which is when the natural human peak is interesting right you're not always ready to go in the morning your creative brain is ready to go in the morning that's what we call groggy if you actually took one of the creativity tests that we learned about in malcolm gladwell's book you would score higher than that on the morning but you would score higher on the factual regurgitation sats at like 11 a.m and then you would do best at gym class at 1 p.m or early afternoon as the olympians do Let's focus a little bit more on the circadian rhythm. That's what this chapter talked about mostly and how that will aid your sleep pattern most. And even plants do this. I used Olympic record breakers because I thought that'd be the most relatable. But I guess I could have just said plants as Matthew Walker did. They track the sun across the sky and then plants know when to close their leaves at night to fall asleep and when we are spending all of our day inside the human body isn't able to track the sun and we have that circadian rhythm inside of us we have to go off of different cues like eating or our alarm clock but the human body is so much more complex than your ficus outside hey you thought i was gonna say the f word than your ficus outside <laughs> I'm going to do that the first time I get my first clean kids show. I'm going to go, hey, what's going on, kitties? Focus you. <laughs> I hope I get kicked off stage. Point being, the plant your grandma could put in the ground tracks your sun just like the human body should, but we should be outside as meant to be in order to sleep better. So if you work outside, you probably sleep better as construction workers do report. Also because they're using their body more, which is better for your circadian rhythm because it knows when it's time to shut down. Let's get a little scientific. Two guys from the University of Chicago, they took a couple week trip. <laughs> this was dope. This was real dope. They took a couple week trip to the Mammoth Cave in Kentucky to live in complete darkness for two weeks. Did I mention that? Two weeks in complete darkness just to measure the human clock. The balls on these guys. And what they were able to prove through this study was that there is an innate human clock, which we already knew, the circadian rhythm. But the human clock is actually 24 hours and 15 minutes long. So it's a little bit longer for some odd reason. And so then they came back to reality <laughs> after post cave mind. However, that affected their lives from there on out for the better, actually, because they went on to study young people's sleep patterns as compared to older people's sleep patterns. And for young people, they run on more of a 26 hour biological clock, just meaning that they have more energy. So the older you get, no, the more energy you lose. That's why I'm going to be down in testosterone pills when I'm like 50, just so I can act like I'm 22 again. <laughs> But this 26-hour circadian rhythm that younger people have also explains the time dilution that people have compared to, like, if you're 15 years old, your birthday seemed like it was a year ago, but when you're 30 years old, it seems like your birthday was last week, and you're like, holy shit, 30 what, 34? Damn! Yeah, as you could tell, I've thought about this a million times because it's my biggest fear. The clock. It's a race against the clock. What are you going to do with your time? <laughs> I'm pretty sure if an armchair psychiatrist just heard that, there'd be a giant red flashing sign in front of his eyeballs that said, Classic anxiety. Prescribe antidepressants. Nah, bitch. I ain't taking your pharmaceuticals. We're going over how all those affect your sleep today. That's how I get off these tangents, as you notice. <laughs> I mentioned how it's going to be later in the show, which it always is, because the shows are fucking three hours long. <laughs> so the way your circadian rhythm changes throughout your life also distorts the way that you percept time, and also distorts the way that you percept life events. Like, things you just have less time to compare it to would be my way to describe it rather than using science. I'm going to use people words. When you're younger, you just have less time to compare it to when you're 30. You're like when you're ter when you're having that 33 year old weird birthday, you're like that year was just like the last one. I didn't do anything different. Whereas when you're being bred through the school system, they change it a little bit. You have a different teacher every year. So you have an easy distinctive marker. People remember thing in bits, you know, different shows, different little points of the show. 
I'm just trying to get you to jump around Nick's not fiction. But the older you get, the bigger catalog you have. So one year, objectively, is a shorter time span. And so when you're 30, when you drop an ice cream cone, it's not that big of a deal. When you're five and you drop your ice cream cone, you are going to scream until your esophagus hurts. And imagine if you did that when you're 30. No, you've dropped a million ice cream cones. <laughs> you've probably dropped a million iPhones. So it's not that big of a deal. Just like when you're a teen and you don't get asked to prom. Oof, dude. Sorry, man. That one hurts. But, <laughs> you know, I work in customer service. <laughs> I constantly work on my skills hitting on people, which you probably shouldn't do on the clock. But people like to be hit on. It's a compliment. And I get to work on my skills. And, you know, sometimes girls look at me and go, what? What did you just say? Or they'll go, oh, my boyfriend does that joke a lot better. And I'm like, okay, baby, whatever you fucking want. But I don't take it as big of a deal because I've suffered more rejection as the kid who just got a no from a promposal. It's just all a sense of scale and melding that all together. That's why your circadian rhythm shrinks throughout your life. And while you're younger, you have a more expanded sleep cycle. And so tying this back to the whole cave thing, since we live in such a... <laughs> most people have a clock strapped to their wrist 24 hours a day. Since we live in such a time-obsessed society, you can dial in your circadian rhythm to be precisely 24 hours instead of 24-15. If you get the proper amount of sunlight, diet, and exercise. Boo! Chores! Yeah. You can perfect your genetic circadian rhythm with those three main ingredients that will save your life better than any pharmaceutical. Sunlight diet and exercise, not proaxidurfotrafamine or whatever. <laughs> and why these guys suffered so hard in the cave is that sunlight of those three, sunlight is the best for your circadian rhythm to get to sleep, to digest, to do, to poop, to do everything on time. Sunlight is the best because it's the most reliable. You're, you're going to be like, but my alarm clock goes off at 7 a.m. Exactly. Every single day. Bitch. The sun has been rising and setting in the same flow for billions of years. And humans have been around for, th it's extending all the time. <laughs> With the more ancient ruins we find, three million years humans have been around in sync with the flow of the rise and the set of the sun. So not your alarm clock, not even meals, because, I, you know, you miss meals all the time, which your body is supposed to rely on for your circadian rhythm. And once again, is how you can perfect your functioning brain and self. But getting that sun is absolutely essential. Get your D, everybody, that vitamin D. How did they prove this? Just like these psychos and heroes that <laughs> went into a cave for a couple weeks for us and didn't look at any lights. Wouldn't you be scared that you're going to come out blind? That is so scary. Wouldn't you be scared of a bear in the cave? So many weird things that could take another two hours of the show up. So the way they were able to test this was through core body temperature samples. Do you know what that means? Rectal thermometer. So these people slept for eight hours a night with a rectal thermometer. And what we were able to see through this, these heroes showed us that Every 90 minutes, basically, you do a sleep cycle, but you only hit REM sleep three times throughout the night. We'll do exact schedules. And this thermometer showed that your core body temperature is essential in regulating that. That's why taking showers is so good before bed because it draws the heat away from your core body temperature and your body temp needs to drop in order to sleep. The interesting part about that segment is how your circadian rhythm is like a subconscious barometer. This is your hypothalamus, the deepest part of your brain. So if you get hit real hard or if you're really sick, your body doesn't know how to heat itself. What do I say? Everything's on a spectrum. And that's true with how people are morning people, night people. Matthew broke it down to 40% of human beings are morning people, 30% night people, and 30% square in the middle of the bell curve so it's not really a bell curve because it's not morning to night i guess but most people lean towards early afternoon as their peak time like we saw with the olympic athletes and so since it's a bell curve i know you're going right now yes only 40 percent of people are morning people i could go tell my boss i'm in the 60 percent and i need to sleep in it's not quite like that it's more like I get up at 7.25 every damn morning I've been waking up lately. I don't know why that exact moment on the clock, I'm like, it's time. Today's the day. We do the day. 
<laughs> but you get on these stupid little nicks. Hey, nicks not fiction. <laughs> The point there, the spectrum, it's a bell curve, though. It's not, I'm in the 60%, I'm in the 99%. It's that your natural alarm clock is probably 8.25 a.m., and then someone else is probably 7.27 a.m., so it's just a little bit moved off. And one of the ways you know that you're sleepy, the melatonin kicks in, you start yawning. Yawning is also contagious when we lived in tribes. If somebody yawned, you knew, all right, we're going to plop down for a couple hours, get some rest. It's a suggestive activity, just like laughing. Okay, we're all doing this as a group now. We are so much more similar to these starlings, you know, these birds that are able to move like a group of fish, or I was going to say minnows, but it sounds a lot nicer to compare humans to the starling birds that fly over Rome than saying we're all fish. But we do all work in these contagious ways and yawning and melatonin is one of those cool ones that transcends just your brain less hippie ground in that a little bit to keep you all attached <laughs> so that hot shower i mentioned before will also release more melatonin in your brain because it draws heat out of your core you know sometimes you get a pump when you shower you kind of come out of the shower flexing real hard sending some nudes you look real good because all the heat all the blood your vascular everything's bought to your surface your epidermis is showing <laughs> and then when that melatonin releases and your eyelids get heavier you also suppress your anxious track of greatest hits that you probably run over your head every night oh my god what am i doing with my life why am i not here here and here how do i get here and here and here my dog hates me why did i cry that one day how come i called my teacher mommy in second grade all that stuff gets suppressed when you put things like melatonin into the equation and that is your natural sleep remedy as well as meditation or hot showers will help you out as well also, traveling westward is easier, but that's kind of more of a hack than a <laughs> than a behavioral advantage you could take on sleep. You're not just going to fly a time zone west every day for the rest of your life. That'd be a podcastable life. <laughs> but when you travel west, it makes the day shorter. So like I was saying, majority of people are in the middle years of their life, so they're not sleeping as well and so their shorter biological clock not the 26 of a teen but their like 22 circadian rhythm matches up perfectly when you take a flight westward and this was shown through a study in the book how flight crews took memory tests and the part of their brain dealing with memory actually shrunk when their biological clock had nothing to grasp onto. So if they were flying for like three months at a time without being grounded anywhere to get their biological clock grabbed onto something, it was just like grabbing at anything and your your prefrontal cortex starts to shrink. It's just like being in the cave like those guys or being in solitary confinement. You have no way to conceptualize time and things just start to slip away like reality. And this example is basically the most sleep-deprived people we have available to study, or Matthew did at least for the sake of this book. Imagine if we didn't sleep, life would be one giant day, a constant stream. How would you compartmentalize things? I, I mentioned before, that's how humans memorize things. That's how we memorize names. Oh, I put you in this group of this friends. That's how I remember all the billionaires, my Dunbar's number. And so that makes why regimented sleep is so good. And the final part of chapter two here was about adenosine that was the name of the chemical that piles up your brain when you don't sleep that i was trying to get before it's basically just like your sleep brain barometer and it just keeps building up and what caffeine does is plug the holes of those receptors so your brain literally cannot even if it's trying to which it actively is it cannot recognize that it's time to sleep and it cannot start to release the melatonin this is on a spectrum though the enzyme in your stomach that metabolizes caffeine is different for everybody so some people can drink a pot of coffee before bed it's probably because they're desensitized to it and that is very bad for your natural sleep cycles but some people can do that and metabolize it within the first couple hours whereas some people i've done like a quad shot of coffee before and i woke up the next day feeling like i was at an end of semester kegger it was wild i'm a coffee bitch apparently <laughs> and that's where i lie on the caffeine metabolization spectrum no shame caffeine is the second most traded 
commodity on earth after oil it's been around you know 1776 that's what started america the tax on tea i saw a meme recently real good meme oh what a meme what a meme it was a picture of the revolutionary war and the brits were like ha huh, you have to pay our tea tax and then the next picture was in america and arizona tea for 99 cents and then britain they're like three dollars a pop usa usa the best way to cut your alcohol arizona iced tea and only for 99 cents a liter born in the usa <laughs> caffeine we are now exporting starbucks to japan japan has the biggest starbucks this is some weird stuff how we're getting them hooked on coffee 10 years ago they have this um anime you know now animes in america i guess it goes both ways but there's this coffee cartoon in japan and the ceos were saying give it 10 years everybody's got to go up with this spongebob like character and then we're gonna bring coffee shops to japan because they drink tea over there that's how they get their caffeine coffee is this western and black death liquid that we drink dude i'm on the coffee train though and we're bringing it over to japan we're getting them hooked to sell them our goods it's just like <laughs> we're, we're also the best in the world at oil move away venezuela we're coming through caffeine is the still standing biggest human experiment in an unfettered drug trade there hasn't ever been prohibition on caffeine there's been prohibition on alcohol there has been a prohibition on opium when the chinese were abusing it in the 1860s and there's a current prohibition on cannabis and thc but there has never been laws enacted against caffeine it's been a free trade so i said a couple months ago and i've been thinking about this because because if you're trying to do something entrepreneurial you have to try to think about getting in somebody's pocket how do you get involved with their routines how do you get involved in someone else's westworld loop and coffee obviously is the perfect way it's an addictive drug it revs you up and you need more when you're off of it it's addictive <laughs> And so we see how there's a coffee shop on every corner. 7-Eleven, they sell meth coffee on every corner. And so David's point here was that since there is coffee shops on every corner, we now have a society that has obviously led to overlooking sleep as a value. Everything has its downside. And the caffeine crash is a real thing. This is when the adenosine floods back into your brain. And with a vengeance, you crash damn hard. It's all at once, and then all that melatonin will pile up on top of it, too. So you either need to double down on the coffee, or you need to go crash. To end the chapter, there was that little study Matthew did about spiders spinning webs, and they tested them on speed, weed, LSD, and caffeine. And marijuana was the most similar looking to a sober web that the spider spun. The cocaine web was half finished and <laughs> had missing sections in it as well. And then the LSD web was vertically spun. Like it didn't have the horizontal on it. It looked, as you would say, trippy. And then the caffeine web was absolute nonsense. It was just here, there, and everywhere. It didn't look like a web. Was this study putting spiders on drugs relevant to sleep research? I really don't have any sort of relevance I can add, so sorry to waste that minute. But it was a pretty cool study, and I gotta do my diligence to sell Matthew Walker's book a little bit here. Looping at the end of the chapter, then back to that teenage sleepover that we're familiar with, hopefully. Those are fun times in your life. After an all-nighter, you get a second wind because your body doesn't know that you slept. Your circadian rhythm starts over. Like I said, the sun comes up, and that's the most powerful thing where your body's like, oh my tits, the sun is up. We got to go find meat. What if we get eaten today? It's a whole new day to worry about stuff. <laughs> so your circadian rhythm starts over, but this time it has the full tank of adenosine racked up in your brain so your body will power on we're not just some wimps that are going to shut down for sleep like sloths but it's absolutely terrible for your brain and your overall health the point being here though is that the circadian rhythm the point of this chapter is the most powerful thing in your body people are born the mother and the child circadian rhythm usually sinks when they are born and then people die at the ebbs of their circadian rhythm so there is really a lot to try to understand in this frequency 
of how the human operates and it's how we leave this lifetime and how we enter this lifetime and it's how we keep sane throughout this lifetime getting that 24 hour clock down getting your sleep to have your dreamland playtime and then come back and get shit done and that's going to bring us to chapter three defining and generating sleep we're going to start this chapter with a little brain twister matthew thrown in which makes it a very readable book these little fun activities <laughs> he says there's no smell touch or taste or anything that you just slept so how do you know when you woke up that you didn't just wake up from a 20-year coma or that you're on some other planet or this is your first time doing this human experience and that you were just loaded with a bunch of memories from yesterday in the past 30 years I guess the answer to that would be, though, through sleep studies, you could just put a camera on yourself and know that you weren't in a coma for 20 years, but that also risks you seeing something paranormal, and it, which is why I will never record myself for 10 hours of sleep, because I don't want to see myself hovering for 30 minutes throughout the night. <laughs> Dude, I'd probably, like, run around on the walls and do wind sprints in my sleep, like, doing push-ups. Ah, you're not good enough. Get on the ceiling and do a 30-minute flank. <laughs> So the camera would prove that sleep is different from being transported here from an alien vessel or being in a coma. And also a way you could prove that I was saying is that if if you're sleeping and the room fills with CO2, not carbon monoxide, that shit will kill you because it's undetectable. But if your room starts to fill up with a bunch of smoke, you wake up in a hot box. That's how you know that you're still semi-functioning and how sleep is a different state of consciousness than death or being knocked out. But one of the other anomalies of sleep that gets discussed in this chapter is time dilation. And time seems to go slower. If you remember Inception, the dream movie, five minutes in the real world is like an hour in the dream world. You could live a full life in a night's sleep in another dream. <laughs> And then sort of in tune with my CO2 house fire, fire idea, your brain sometimes will wake up 30 seconds before your alarm goes off. So there is that circadian rhythm, that biological clock never stops when you are in this comatosis of sleep. And this is how we start to measure sleep cycles. So let's learn a little bit here. Brain waves, eye movements, muscle contractions, those are all the type of tests that they would use to measure sleep cycles. And just like we have to get through the years, one week, one day at a time, you get through 10 hours of sleep through cycles. And it's broken into, just Google if you wanted to, rather than listen to me, hypnographic basic sleep graph. And we basically, we really sleep in 90 minute intervals. Those 90 minute intervals is like a dolphin. When we breach, we come up for REM sleep. And that's when your eyes start to look around and you're actually doing a VR existence for a little while while your brain melds together the experiences from that day. You mesh those together with previous experiences and creates VR experiences where you can overcome problems problems and hopefully don't fall off that building for the millionth time and wake up right before you hit the ground when you're in that REM sleep one of the maybe that's the fun part for people because you're just in the frequency of the universe home that's what the sleep waves look like it just goes up and down and it's a extreme meditation and that's why it's so regenerative for your neurons and it cleans everything out there's this new electric therapy where people are holding on to like Thetan level measurers like some Scientology type of BS but it actually sends pulses that'll go through your brain and is proven to improve sleep quality it's crazy technology coming through we're gonna get to that but the human body is the best technology you come up for these 90 minute little adventures and then you go down back into the NREM sleep where you twitch for a little bit and just knock out like a rock. But you're not in that knocked out type of rock like an opioid induced sleep like you're taking Ambien or some shit like that where it turns your functioning brain off and it just knocks you out. It doesn't actually make you sleep. It's just some weird drug induced semi coma that you're going into but not the good sleep one where you have the regenerative effects it just knocks you out the people that are taking these drugs have sleep onset insomnia so they can't fall asleep but they're not getting the benefits of sleep they're just getting knocked out by the drugs so when you get that real NREM sleep when your body goes into 
our closest thing to death during our human experience and REM sleep. The way Matthew described it is like your brain is doing war chants during a stadium game, whereas in NREM sleep, your brain waves are all just people talking. All the fans are talking as a constant buzz, and you can channel that for a little chant here and there throughout the day. That's how you focus on little things. But when your brain waves get in sync for a long period of time, which is measured through these electromagnetic waves and then can be enhanced if they pulse your brain a little bit more, those chants get louder, though. Mm, mm, that stuff feels good, man. <laughs> this is why those people that it's just annoying to talk about it. i'm gonna try to breeze over this this is why meditation is a really deep restorative state and mimics the deepest restorative state in consciousness which is nrem sleep and this is why like hippies and people who meditate can just fall asleep anywhere because they have that synced brainwave activity on cue they could just flip back onto it same thing why do you feel so good after you go home from church you're reciting prayers with a group or doing your ohms at yoga it's just to get your brain into these cycles and it's usually five sleep cycles you get in an eight hour rest with two REM sleeps so maybe two good dreams you get thrown in there and 2 a.m and 5 a.m are the biggest peaks in NREM sleep that's if you go to bed at 11 which is top of the bell curve for most people so if you get in some trippy dreams you'll probably wake up like they're saying at 3 a.m or like a little bit before you get up to go to work did that just happen and then you go back to sleep and forget everything that just happened so to finish up chapter three about defining these sleep waves matthew used am and fm waves in comparison to sleep so of course i felt the obligation and interest to talk about this and put it into the show am radio waves are these very low reverberating waves that have a far frequency and can travel distances and don't fade it's like the trucker radios there that's why they're in the middle of nowhere so they need these am waves to go very far and that is like the nrem sleep because in nrem sleep that's when you're logging those long-term memories so you have these long am waves that go over and your brain is basically in that time like i said it's your closest to death it's your deepest meditation your brain is solidifying all of its routes your deepest memories and the ones that you're going to try to add to deep memories from that day whereas fm waves the short distance can only travel short distances but they have much more vivid information so just like i remember my day today i can remember somebody handing me something the look on their face but if i tried to remember a week ago or a year ago somebody doing that it's an am wave it's farther long frequency wave that i can only put together the idea of but these vivid fm waves are what happens in your rem sleep and consciousness and so to go real deep as deep as the state of the universe as deep as i could take it the universe is not conscious that's why humans are amazing we're these pieces of fabric floating through infinity that have the ability to recognize us as parts of the universe that's being conscious and the state of the universe is not conscious the state of the universe is one of these long flows the tide goes in the tide comes out the big bang everything expands for 20 billion years the big crunch everything goes back together in and out and so when we go into these deep sleeps we're restored to our unconscious state what I'm trying to say here is that when we're asleep, that's the closest thing we'll ever know what it's like to being dead. And, you know, nobody's afraid to go to sleep at night. Most people like to go to sleep at night, but nobody wants to take that last breath on their deathbed. While it's funny and for whatever sick reason, trending to talk about suicide, nobody's ready to go, man. We get a taste of it every night. You get to tune in to that deep unconscious state, the state of the universe, the mm, that slow in and out that your brain does and matthew is alluding to here that's what your matter your carbon atoms where carbon-based life forms go back to throughout the universe after we get to finish using these meat bodies so get your sleep and extend your time with this matter and that's going to bring us to the end of chapter three because we hit all-time preachiness level with that part <laughs> chapter four here this is was titled ape beds dinosaurs and napping with a half brain 
and this chapter talks about animals and how they sleep and how it's similar and dissimilar to humans because there are some crazy sleep patterns we've discovered which would be cool if there was some deep state CIA pill where I could skip my eight hours of sleep like some animals are able to with no ill effects. So let's dive in. Every animal discovered. Many cells to few cells. Insects, fish, reptiles, mammals. We all have some sort of period throughout the day that resembles sleep. A state of consciousness where you are not fully responsive. And so what scientists must conclude from this is that there is an evolutionary advantage to giving the brain the ability to shut down for this period of time. Worms and mollusks, even the most primitive forms of life, have to sleep. Think about that, a little cute worm going to sleep at night. His tiny, his probably like 20 neuron brain has to regenerate whatever it is that we do during this mystery of sleep. And as big as these multi-trillion neuron brains us humans have, we have to regenerate them at sleep because there is some sort of advantage, even though we're knocking ourselves out for hours at a time. So wouldn't you think like sloths are super geniuses then because they sleep for 22 hours a day, so they're constantly regenerating brain power? But no. There is a point of diminishing return. As most things in life, you can abuse food, you can die from over drinking water, you can abuse drugs, you can abuse anything, including sleep. But what's special about humans is that we REM sleep. We get to do this dream period where we log short-term information to old-term information. We can learn. We don't just have this preordained NREM flow or preloaded chip of evolutionary advantages like a cat wander sniff eat try to get pet walk away purr run around at three in the morning and tear down your blinds we get to learn and use nrem sleep at night insects reptiles fish even aquatic mammals so dolphins and whales they only NREM sleep. They don't get to REM sleep. They can't do this processing of ideas and go into the VR space. That is the dream universe. Dude, where the hell do we go when we, when we create these entire worlds? You're telling me that's in our brain? I'm thinking humans are interdimensional. I'm going Alex Jones. Interdimensional child molesters. <laughs> All right, let's not go pseudoscience. <laughs> in the book, Matthew says, since... Dolphins and whales don't get to REM sleep. So this neurochemical bath, I've been not saying it, but your brain releases dimethyltryptamine into your head while you sleep. That's the drug that your brain is on while you're asleep. You're literally tripping balls. So these dolphins and these mammals, they don't get to release that chemical. So that's why they're so playful during the day. And they create these weird games where they drop shells at the top of the ocean and try to catch them. They have sports, man. These things are really intelligent. And that's because the drug of creation does seep into their brain then throughout their waking consciousness rather than just at nighttime and gets integrated then through REM sleep like humans or gets integrated through taking drugs like humans. A trick, though, that these mammals do have is that they can sleep with half their brain at a time, so they never actually have to fully shut down. I guess the ocean is a totally different game. Like, you can't go up and hide in a tree like us monkeys were able to. That's why in REM sleep, your body has a chemical that paralyzes you. You literally can't move. That I've had sleep paralysis before. I'll get into this a little bit later. I'll tell those stories, man. That shit is scary. You can't move. It's an NREM period where you're in that paralysis, but you come to your semi-conscious. And so, yeah, humans were able to get up in the trees to sleep to be able to do this deep sleep. But dolphins, they got to sleep with half their brain at a time because they're just floating out there. A shark can eat them if, if they were ever to just stop and sleep. That's why sharks, if they stop swimming, they literally die. Their brains aren't that developed, but it's cool how we can learn in nature about these different brain forms and yo we came from that we used to be single cells in a puddle started from the bottom now we apes humans can't exactly do that full half sleep that dolphins and whales can strangely enough matthew found that when you put a human in a sleep environment like a hotel or a sleep research facility someplace they're not used to they will sleep lighter with half of their brain so you are fully asleep but like a quarter of your brain is on watch for you which 
alludes to that point I was saying before that your internal smoke detector or <laughs> yeah that is always on but we just can't quite do it as well as the dolphins and the whales can which is partially why the CIA was holding <laughs> generations of dolphins captive and drugging them <laughs> I wouldn't be as mad about abusing these animals if I actually got to read the research as well <laughs> And then some of the smarter whales, like sperm whales, they actually can go full brain sleep, but they can't REM sleep. They just go full brain sleep, and they only do it a couple times a year. It's that weird phenomena where they go vertical. <laughs> it's weird to see. Then you're actually seeing this 60-foot creature the size of a six-story building, and there are these creepy videos of scuba divers going up and touching fins with these sperm whales while they're asleep vertical, full brain sleeping. Middle of the chapter, let's get to the bird brains. No more fish here. Migrating birds can actually take multi-second naps while they're traveling. Mid-air, they will fall asleep for short periods of time. And birds can actually REM sleep. They do in these short little naps. Because think about it. Their lifetime is shorter. Though, so their circadian rhythm is shorter. And their perception of time is shorter. Like I was talking about the prom date before. And me getting rejected all the time. <laughs> birds are able to do everything then quicker. Including get a REM sleep on the fly. They can dream within seconds and then wake up and keep flying. We're just discovering this now. We're just discovering that humans can run ultra marathons. These are these like multi hundred mile races that people are starting to run in the middle of the desert. The first guy to run a marathon died. The one in ancient Greece, you know, he died immediately after he ran it. So we are always pushing the boundaries. And during these ultra marathon runs, People have claimed to micro sleep. So they said they have gone to sleep for like hours at a time. They feel like they've gone through multiple sleep sessions, but it was only a couple seconds. Their uh, running partner or, or whoever was like, yo, you okay? It looks like you just nodded off. And they're like, I just got a full night's sleep. Are you serious? Why'd you just let me sleep that long? So we are discovering when you push the human body to its limits that it's capable of these evolutionary advanced capabilities like micro sleeps. As I was saying, some of the declassified files about those dolphin studies was about how they actually have their own language. And so the fact that they have that DMT dripping into their brain during the day is able to make them interactive and creative enough to talk to each other. There are other species on this planet that talk to each other and Japanese people herding and hunting them like it's sheep. And they tried to give dolphins acid and then talk to them. And they were able to talk to the dolphins for a little bit. But there is that story about the lady, <laughs> the agent, agentess, is there a feminization word for agent yet? The female agents <laughs> got so close with the dolphin that they thought they were living in a house together. They like flooded a house and had the dolphin swim around the house with the lady. And the dolphin kept trying to have sex with the lady. So they had to terminate the CIA study. And that is our tax dollars at the very deepest declassified level, everybody. Next nonfiction, cold hard facts. That's not a conspiracy. You can go read about that United States study. <laughs> So animals like these birds and some aquatic creatures can do biphasic sleeps. We see this in societies without electricity. So one of the best things about humans are that we are adaptable. Whatever you groom us to do since our birth, we will do. They talk about that in 1984 in Brave New World. All the utopian books, they talk about how meldable humans are. And Greece... Until the 1980s, they were having their siesta type of lifestyle. Spain did this as well. But in the 1980s, Greece outlawed the siesta. The government came in and said the period from 5 to 9 no longer approved by government and universities. And the following years, coronal fatalities increased by 30%. That's like heart attacks and deaths related to sleep and cardio issues <laughs> they killed 30 percent more of people died that shouldn't have because they changed everybody's lifestyle so yeah humans are very well meldable but we are also not good to change your therapist will go i think you may have an aversion to change yeah, humans are habitual creatures. If you get habitualized to smoking weed and watching cartoons, you're going to do that. If you get habitualized to smoking weed and going to the gym, you're going to do that. We're just creatures of habit. If you get habitualized to wake up at 9 to 5 and go to school and then go to work and then die, you're going to do that. 
And so you see these places like Greece, who were accustomed to for their entire lineage, sleeping in the afternoon, like we talked about a couple books ago. They have these periods in Western Europe. They have this thing called second sleep, where you wake up in the middle of the night for a few hours. You have a snack, you read, you write, you play, you fuck, and then you go back to sleep. And that's how people have been living for thousands, hundreds of thousands, and potentially since all of our information gets corrupt. I'll be keeping these Nixon nonfiction fiction on a flash drive. That's how these Greek people have been able to sleep. And so in 1980, they took out the second sleep and the nap, and it killed a shitload of people because it literally broke their hearts. <laughs> Some South American nations still do have the second sleep, but, you know, we westernized Europe, and we're about to westernize Venezuela. And in these napping communities like Acara, Greece, and then some places in Spain, Tokyo, and then retirement communities in um, Northern California, Napa area, people will live to like 120 years old or 90 years old is the average. Your life expectancy is increased by four times the usual. I mean, saying four times longer than the American is a terrible control group, though, because we eat refined sugar every day and caffeine, so we don't sleep or eat or exercise exercise a third of us are obese man we are not a good control group you british twat matthew <laughs> and then he talked about primates a little bit more to end the chapter because it was a chapter about animals and other primates sleep from 10 to 15 hours longer than humans but only with nine percent rem sleep and then humans sleep for eight hours but with 25 percent rem sleep so we just sleep more efficient than these apes and then think of a million years down the line when we're super great apes or a better version of humans we'll be able to perfect those micro sleeps where these people are doing these hundred percent rem sleeps for 10 seconds at a time we'll figure that out and get it down to a science but for now it's sleep hygiene and i touched on this before so we don't have to get into it too much but apes also have that paralyzing agent in their sleep where not all animals do because they can also rem sleep whereas they won't fall out of trees 50 feet up when they're running around in their dreams their eyelids are the only things that can move but as we saw through these studies and as i just explained rem sleep is what makes us the better monkeys it's that creative part in that last chapter it exacerbates our best qualities the best qualities of our fist-sized brains that we have we are more social and more cognitively intelligent because we have these rem sleep periods where we're able to log new information and learn better than apes and that preachy bit of happiness is gonna end chapter four for us as we move along to chapter five in the end of part one here changes in sleep across the lifespan so this is gonna end our technical bits and base of knowledge about sleep so we could start flying a little bit more like I mentioned, humans are born and die in our circadian rhythms, and right before a human is getting ready to be born, the fetus, the last week before birth, you REM sleep for over 12 hours a day. Your brain is really starting to make connections and get ready like, this thing is coming, man. You better get ready. You have to go do the human experience. So let's get this brain a little bit ready. <laughs> And some of Matthew's sleep studies showed in pregnant women and newborns then. The converse of what I just stated, the more you sleep, the more your brain develops, as fetuses do. The people who are on the autism spectrum get less sleep in those developing brain stages. And with less REM sleep, then it dampens the development of social interaction skills, which you can see then the correlation to autism. So it's not exactly causation, but that's not all a loss. The people that are on the spectrum and are getting the less REM sleep in the womb, they're getting more NREM sleep, and they are then better at meditative activities like math problems or logging things in excel things where you can zone out or apply base knowledge not try to build on existing things you're applying rules to something existing and people like steve jobs and the best programmers on earth were on the autism spectrum because they had that nrem cork that had their frequency running a little bit harder with those programming like tasks 
so as a fetus you need a lot of REM sleep this chapter is REM sleep across the lifespan think about it like the gym because REM sleep is how we develop our brains and so then babies got to hit the gym they got to develop that tiny little neuron that they call a brain <laughs> yeah pick on someone my own size no that baby's brain is pathetic I saw a deer walk two seconds after it was born. You just want baby food and to cry and suck tits. Me too. <laughs> that REM sleep is a pump though. Like I said, it's intensifying your electrical frequency. Like you go to the gym, you get that post shower. All the capillaries are being expanded. Blood is pumping through your veins. Your brain, all the smallest capillaries are getting blood pumped through them when you are in that meditative period of NREM sleep. So you know you'll never be as big as your pump <laughs> at the gym. You look at yourself in the gym after you just drop two 40-pound dumbbells. You swear you look like Hulk Hogan himself. And then you go home after walking in 30-degree weather and you're all shriveled up. You'll never be as big as your pump. And you'll never be as calm. You won't know, but you'll never be as efficient as you are in your NREM sleep. And so a baby brain deprived of that, an infant brain without sleep, will forever be a brain under construction. So get your babies to sleep that's what they do all day help them out with that this is the first we're going to talk about alcohol in the book but unfortunately not in the fun way because this is not shots 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 this is fetal alcohol poisoning <laughs> fetal alcohol suppresses REM sleep that's why like I'm saying you get that oxycotton type of sleep where you just sleep like a sack of potatoes you don't actually go through the brain cleansing sleep cycles if the mother is drinking with the baby in the womb it leads to a blood alcohol content that will be the same in your breast milk so obviously drinking when you're pregnant is a bad thing it says it on every beer bottle that you shouldn't but drinking right after you're pregnant is just as dangerous because you're, like I just said, your breast milk has the same exact BAC as whatever you've been sipping on. So if you had a glass of wine the night before and you tit feed your baby the next morning, he's going to be drunk that day. You probably won't notice because he's just going to sleep harder because it's going to knock him out. Like I said, alcohol is a depressant and will suppress the REM sleep and your baby will just knock out. And so you'll be happier and you'll drink more wine. It'll be a positive feedback loop, but negative for the baby's brain. <laughs> so babies then try to make up for that REM sleep when the booze is processed out and that happens through the rest of your lifetime you can't sleep on alcohol you got to wait till it's all processed out and you got to take that 5 p.m nap oh i was hung over all day i got to take this nap in the afternoon and then surprise you feel great and ready to go for saturday night now well that's because you slept you're probably not as hung over as you thought you were 50% of that is probably you're dead tired because you were out drinking and you also didn't sleep. That will be in our drinking chapter. Babies don't party as hard as we do, so let's just tease that for now. In childhood and adolescence, sleep is super important. Obviously, it's just a developing brain, like in the babies. When you're not an infant anymore, you go from a poly sleep pattern just like sleeping all the time childhood you have a biphasic sleep pattern because you take that nap that they give you in preschool and then when you wake up it is bred out of you into a monophasic sleep pattern and what we see in the developing brain is that rationalization is the last thing to develop and your brain doesn't stop developing till you're 25 which is why I don't feel going out to interview for radio host positions yet because I'm a 22 year old. What the hell do I have to talk about? And literally my brain isn't even developed yet, which also explains why I am not, you know, saving money on rent, living with my parents and moved out to Colorado to pursue comedy and radio. It's because your rationalized brain isn't fully developed. I don't have to sit here and justify all my decisions, but there's, you know, a method to the madness. Your brain isn't totally developed until you're 25. So get your sleep, do your drugs. <laughs> And so it's the same with your sleep pattern. It's your sleep pattern totally isn't developed as well. Like we said, you go down up from the 26-hour sleep pattern down to you're more in tune with the earth, 24. You're not in a womb anymore. <laughs> and a lot of that, because the first nine months of your existence, you're alive in the womb, bro. Your existence has already started. That's when your neuroconsciousness already starts. Your brain patterns, that mantra, that NREM has already started. And so you see when we get to 25 that's when the natural human development 
is set in you are ready for that nine to five human factory worker edition that we are breeding humans for nowadays and then in teens you're still basically at that biphasic sleep pattern and their natural circadian rhythm is a couple hours off from the 25 ground down to the factory version of a human Asking the pure brain of a teenager to wake up at 6 or 7 a.m. is like asking an adult to go to bed at 8 or 9 p.m. I don't feel like it. Yeah, that's a terrible excuse. It would be better to say my evolutionary clock won't let me, but you literally don't feel like it. Like, how do you describe when you see a woman with a nice bosom what you feel like? It's just instinct you can't tell these teenagers they have to wake up at 6 or 7 a.m when their biological clock is keeping them shut down they're in that groggy state for a longer period their brain is being knocked off of their circadian rhythm matthew's point here i just tangented for a while about breast milk and alcohol fetus poisoning but they mean his deeper point I don't want to get into because it makes me seem like a communist, but this was his point, is that children don't need this regimented school thing. If you get your work done during the day and learn what you had to, that's all that matters. But being somewhere for a bell to ring at 7 a.m. is bad for a developing brain. It's just like developing the fetus of oxygen and causing autism. This is going to cause a more defective human in their mid to late 20s. It's a Bad idea for social humans, but good idea for factory workers. And so putting your things, that's how I subconsciously feel, Freudian slip, putting your kids on things like caffeine or Ritalin is just totally jacking up not only their circadian rhythm and sleep pattern, but the development of their brain. So let's finish up this chapter and overall section then about sleep across the lifespan. Sleep proficiency goes down throughout your lifetime so when you're an adult you might actually lay in your bed for 10 hours just like you did when you were 20 but your sleep proficiency goes down as much as 80 percent the older you get so you're just not able to produce as good of sleep you're not able to get into those circadian rhythms and nrem sleeps it sucks but even though you're putting in the effort the older you get sometimes the quality of your sleep is not as good. So you could take the tips we have at the end of the show, like taking a warm shower, having the best bed sheets, blocking out LEDs an hour before sleep, having a totally dark sleeping space, you know, keeping it cold, all those good things. We're going to move along here to part two. Why would you sleep? Think about it. Evolutionarily, sleep is the dumbest thing we do. If you were a doctor and you had a couple having a newborn baby, pretend nobody in the world ever slept. We're just fully functioning humans. And you would have to explain to this newborn couple how their baby is going to slip into a coma for a third of the day. Every single night for eight hours, they're going to pass out. They're going to twitch a bunch, sometimes be totally paralyzed and be unresponsive. So why is this a good thing? We touched upon before, every single functioning organism does have a restorative period of sleep. And what these scientists like Matthew have found is that the benefits of sleep are just like a Swiss army knife against sickness. It reboots your immune system and it has you ready to combat new and already dormant diseases that are within your system so chapter six here is really talking about the benefits of sleep so let's start this quote off with a chapter matthew uses a fun little activity here he use he conjures up an image of sleep as a drug that your brain is on every single night and a miracle drug at that matthew says scientists have discovered a revolutionary new treatment that makes you live longer it enhances your memory and makes you more creative i'll do it like an advertisement it makes you look more attractive it keeps you slim and lowers food cravings it protects you from cancer and dementia wards off colds the flu and it lowers your risks of heart attacks and stroke not to mention diabetes you'll even fear happier less depressed and less anxious are you interested sleep so all of those positive things, longer life, better memory, more creative, less dementia, less depressed, less anxious. If there was a drug that you could take and it gave you all those benefits, you would take it. But that's just called sleep, like I'm saying the whole time. And unfortunately, there is no pill to this date that's ready for consumers that would give us all those benefits. So we still have to go unconscious for those eight hours to access our Swiss army knife of fighting sickness. And this chapter six was called Your Mother and Shakespeare Knew the secrets about sleep your mother and shakespeare in reference to how shakespeare used to write a lot about sleep but shakespeare is totally irrelevant throughout the chapter otherwise just 
call out to the British homeboys, I guess. So throughout these sleep studies, because Matthew works at UC Berkeley, it's a school, the people that he has to study on are students, and a lot of the tests are about studying and get running for exams. So fact like textbook memorization requires deep and REM sleep. This is one of the benefits of sleep. If when you get into those deep meditative and REM sleep states, all of those basic facts and textbook like regurgitative knowledge is cemented into your long term flow. One of Matthew's studies, like this at UC Berkeley, they took two groups studying, and one group took a 90 minute siesta after the lesson, and they wound up doing better on exams, sleeping after class. But remember, your college teachers would tell you, go home and study this right after class. That'll make it cement in your brain so you won't forget it for the test. But no, according to actual sleep study science, if you take a nap after your test for 90 minutes and let your powerful ass subconscious do all the work for you, as long as you're just being present in class, that's how I got through college. I didn't exactly get through with flying colors, but you know, you get the degree. If you're paying attention in class and actually tossing the ball around of ideas that the professor is trying to get you to think about, as long as you commit, that is a part of your day that your brain is going to log into your long-term memory at night as long as you're not going to a kegger that night. So just like the apple a day keeps the doctor away when teachers tell you to go home and study as soon as you're done learning, that's not good for your brain. It's more stress on your brain when you should just be transferring the memories from your hippocampus to the long term. The hippocampus is just like a flash drive. It has limited memory. And then you need to upload that to your CPU, your hard drive at night while you sleep. So without sleep, you're just like a computer rebooting all day. And for the flash drive analogy, to put that along with Matthew's study, if you don't sleep well the night before an exam or a big exam review, you won't remember much because your hard drive still has baloney on it from yesterday. You weren't able to unload your hard drive through NREM sleep. The adenosine is still racked up in your brain and you can't log these new memories and even being present in class that if you're sleep deprived isn't going to be helpful. And in this study, they found that following a night of sleep, full cycled sleep, your brain can retrieve memories that it couldn't have the night prior. So like I might have forgotten the name of my second grade teacher, but if someone says sleep on it, when you wake up, you might actually have a memory that you did not have before you went to sleep. And that's because you made a note of it subconsciously and then your brain did that deep dive while you were asleep. And that grogginess period while you're just awake is when you're most creative and you make these new slash old connections about that old teacher and whatever she used to do you might have a new memory that you don't even remember oh yeah my teacher used to give us these those old people hard candies whenever we would tell on someone who farted in class that's why my desk neighbor had cavities letting them rip baby the nazis did a sleep deprivation study proving this and they had some of the worst sleep deprivation studies the nazis but that's just what happens in these socialist societies Dr. Mengele is the notorious Nazi one. He did some of these sleep studies and was known for testing on twins because that's how you can see the epigenetic system. We'll have to do another book on that, but it shows how you have your DNA and then you have your RNA, which is it changes throughout your life. So how you live your specific life, not your entire lineage, but your 70 years at best here or 30 years before you have a kid, that affects your kid's genetics. So that's what Dr. Mengele was into the Nazis. And then there was, we talked about last week with Dostoevsky and the gulags in Soviet Russia, they test on their own people. And now we could talk about the Tuskegee Airmen experiments, Operation Midnight, Operation Northwoods, MK Ultra, Agent Orange in Briar County, Florida. There are all these types of declassified and (laughs) classified files that the U.S. is testing on our people as well, too. And what all of these powerful totalitarian nations have found is that sleep deprivation is one of the best torture tools. No surprise, all of these super powerful bureaucracies were able to find this out. Get off of that a little bit, though. In 2006, they did a study where they put electrodes, those little tiny circles, on the front and back of a guy's skull before he went to brain. And then they synced electric pulses with his brain over that NREM mantra. And then these people were able to go into a super sleep. So on this topic a little bit more, Matthew was also able to work with government entities to study 
sleep and deep sleep restorative states and in 2006 he mentioned a study he got to be a part of with the military where they put electrodes on the front and back on some soldier skulls and they were able to sync pulses with the soldiers nrem mantra so just their normal brain pulse waves of sleep in their deepest sleep and they were able to then ramp up the effectiveness of their sleep and the restorative benefits so they were able to memorize more facts they recovered better from their physical training it's like having a super soldier or recharging the battery of your your gi joe unit they are ready to go again faster that's why the military wants to study these things so the information will trickle down to us eventually through things like matthew walker's book here and then he took that information to uc berkeley and they did a study where it was a rocking bed and they were able to find at his university that even just sleeping in a giant crib enhances the regenerative effects of sleep it just like mimics the womb your first nine months of experience in this human form it's mimicking that to be able to sleep and develop and redevelop every single night and targeted memory is not that far off of these super sleeps that we're learning about imagine someone unlocking all of your repressed thoughts just years after all the awkward hellos handicapped people that you chose to ignore <laughs> well francis crick that's the guy that invented dna it's not invented but he discovered the double helix model for dna once he discovered all this about dna super smart guy francis crick was like all right what's the biggest mystery about our human form sleep yeah so he starts learning about that his theory was that rem sleep is our brain's final wash over and check of certain material before deciding if it was trash at the end of the day so it's like you looking through your trash file before hitting empty trash on your computer that's what you're doing in rem sleep francis crick thought and so matthew walker read this really smart guy's papers did a study then marking some facts for his students so he gave them a giant list of like a hundred things with r for remember or f for forget at the end of those hundred facts and what he was able to find through this is that your brain has selective memory basically you can tell your brain this is important let's log this into long-term memory and then subconsciously while you're sleeping in this nrem period your brain does that final wash over did the fact have an f or an r next to it get rid of it or keep it in so francis crick they didn't even have mris they didn't have anything back then and this guy hit the nail on the head of what nrem sleep was and matthew was able to prove this through his study about selective memory through sleep so thank your brain thank you mr brain for doing all that work for you while you're asleep and unloading that hard drive from short term to long term memory i get lazy i still have like old hard drives sitting in my backpack in my room that i don't know what's sitting on them but my brain does that type of stuff for me while i sleep <laughs> truly the best thing in the universe <laughs> no wonder they call it the biggest mystery in the universe because i can't find anything else that'll make me do that work so let's finish this chapter chapter six start at part two Usain Bolt, we touched upon before, he takes naps before his world record-breaking runs in the early afternoon. So sleep isn't just good for fact learning, but it's also good for motor cortex skills, which if you're using our logic forwards backwards by now, you would just apply the reverse. If you're sleep deprived, it causes you to get in car crashes more than being drunk. It affects your motor cortex skills. You can't drive. But when you do have sleep or take a good little nap, then you're about to be doing some stunt devil type of driving. And the way Matthew was able to test this in his sleep lab was by making righties do lefty tasks and lefties do righty tasks. And some people, like, as soon as you're up from a nap, if you want to learn how to juggle, that's the time. <laughs> Put a couple five minutes in every time you're up from your nap and you'll be juggling in no time. In Matthew's example, specifically from the left and the right hand, they just did it with typing. So you'd get better at typing a sequence of numbers. But then when they did it the next day, when you were typing the number with your non-dominant hand, you also had more rhythm with it. So naps and full rested periods of sleep make you more rhythmic and better at instruments as well. Go figure. Better at motor cortex skills. Also why babies will sleep a lot more in the time when they're learning to walk. They need to beef that booty brain up. And some more professional information, Andre Iguodala had his sleep study researched and injuries increased with a lack of sleep. He wasn't able to regenerate and he probably did one of those Kevin Ware type of pivots and his shin is popping out of his shin. <laughs> 
even from babies to the best athletes that we have, sleep will make you better at every single level. And sleep also has the best algorithm in the universe, even better than Google search algorithm. It's able to make connections for you while you're asleep. In that REM sleep, it connects the old obscure things to the new things that happen today. And that's why it's like the writing tool. Another common writing tool I touched upon before, how I just sift through all my garbage. Something a writing class will tell you is pick two unrelated life events, yours or someone else's, and how can they relate? Easier when you do it to your own experiences, because who doesn't love talking about themselves? If you can just pick two random things and start writing how they are intertwined, it's creating new pathways for your brain. Every time you create a new sentence, something in college me and my buddies would do just when we were bored trying to make each other laugh, try to say a sentence that has never been said before. Jesus Christ's light up sketchers looked absolutely awesome when he ran across the Red Sea <laughs> in year 05. I don't think anyone's probably said that one. That's the point of the game here, and that's the point of REM sleep. Your brain is just making connections that you never would have thought of before, and then you can mill over it with your conscious brain, which is maybe not as smart as the unconscious brain as we're learning the further we get. My bet that is that it is smarter because the brain really is the most complex thing in the universe. Some people think an argument would be, though, if you put just me against Google and ask us fact for fact, who's going to be able to come up with the answer for these one-off questions? But Google doesn't have this reverse search algorithm that my brain does in the middle of the night, making new connections to old things. You know, my brain never asked me to share my location. We have a built-in GPS. When I know where I am, I know how I need to get home. But on the same hand, though, there, Elon Musk is talking about his Neuralink, which is going to put that computer and GPS in your brain, which some people need. I think I just have an obsolete brain. My stuff is good for <laughs> GPS. Yeah, outdated there. I remember stupid facts, which is good for these podcasts and nothing else when we do have search algorithms. <laughs> <laughs> point being here though sleep beefs up all those best qualities of your brain and your brain is better than google so treat that thing with the best night's sleep that you can and also use your non-dominant hand <laughs> it'll help you develop new neuro pathways which offsets dementia and you'll live longer and that'll bring us to chapter seven called too extreme for the guinness book of world records you'll see why it's called this shortly this chapter is about the bad things that happen with the lack of sleep so the last chapter was about the benefits you know you could shoot a basketball better juggle when you get up from a nap these are about the bad things when you don't sleep and the guinness book of world records is aware that there's a laundry list of bad things that happen when you don't sleep they no longer acknowledge the most days gone without sleep as a world record because too many people died trying to beat it <laughs> your body starts to shut down after a week without sleep it's worse than any drug withdrawal that we know of on the planet your body needs the drug of sleep you know in the meantime guinness world records i'm pretty sure they still have this category of world's highest free fall and you see these videos of guys going up have to be sponsored by red bull to get a spaceship to take them to the edge of space and they jump out in a spacesuit and deploy their parachute you still get a trophy for that but they know that sleep loss is so much more dangerous they won't even acknowledge it let's get into this chapter seven a little bit 10 days of six hours of sleep. This is, sounds like most people's life. 10 days of six hours of sleep is equal to one day of full sleep deprivation. So you're literally doing an all nighter if you're living sleep deprived. And you can't tell when you're sleep deprived, just like the bar example. You know, you don't know when you're drunk and you want to walk home. You don't know when you're sleep deprived and you need even more sleep than the night before. You think you just need eight tonight, but you actually need 10 to get all that adenosine out of your brain. So you're walking around with this distorted self-image. And some people are 10 years in on this crazy heist. <laughs> They've been pulling it off just getting those six hours for 10 years. And it's, it's this vortex. It sucks you in, keeps making you do worse when what you need is hygiene to get out of that. Concentration will suffer heavily with a lack of sleep. Your brain will try to do these little micro sleeps to make up for everything that you're losing from. But you can't. Because not only are you trying to then pay attention to a boring subject that is an office meeting or a class you don't like, your brain is trying to stay on, retain this information, and now it's trying to stay awake because you didn't sleep last night. So you're incorporating micro sleeps into your lecture. It's that old thing when you would have your head was heavy on your hand and it would fall off and hit your head on the desk. Well, a lot less motherfuckers think it's funny when you just micro slept for five seconds on the freeway going 60 miles per hour. 
<laughs> so obviously we're using classroom examples it's not that big of a deal when you're falling asleep but if you're trying to micro sleep while you have highway hypnosis doing a five hour trucker haul you're probably going to kill someone because you're traveling 300 feet in this 0.5 seconds that you have your eyes closed this loops back to how dangerous and more prevalent than anything drowsy driving is and why they don't <laughs> let you try to break the world record for sleep deprivation even in matthew took a couple pages to talk about this even in cases where people do get duis they're also sleep deprived it's just like that thing i was talking about that sunday scaries hangover man the hangover of multiple days of drinking or or not sleeping that's the thing is you aren't sleeping it's that on top of drinking if i just had eight shots and went to sleep at 10 p.m that's different than having eight shots and staying up till 2 a.m it's like a compounding effect straining your brain now this will lead us into truckers a little bit, the micro sleeps, you know, 80% of truckers are overweight and 50% are obese. You weren't ready for that. 50% obese. Do you know what that means? That means your BAC is over 30. You are a third fat. A third of what you're lugging around everywhere on this earth is just a sack of fat. And that's how most of Americans live and 50% of uh, truck drivers live. 80% of truck drivers are overweight. They all have sleep apnea, which is then a sleep onset illness and then <laughs> and quality of sleep depriver. And they're driving drowsy all day. So it just makes for less safe workways in America, roadways getting anywhere. And this ties back to the impaired performance after a year of a lack of sleep. You don't know that you're impaired when you're impaired for over 10 years of sleeping for six hours. You don't know you're at 60%. That's why optimization is this hot new thing. People going to hot yoga, taking all their supplements and vitamins. You want to optimize. You can make it sound as corny and millennial as you want, but people have been doing this for generations. <laughs> That's the whole thing about Buddhism. In order to transcend and get to the next carnation, you have to perfect this form, or you're just going to get sent back into the soul of ethers. I think on this podcast, we'll read the Tibetan Book of the Dead eventually. I don't know if that's considered nonfiction, but we'll check that out. Make some bending to the rules if need be. That's about all that ancient knowledge of reincarnation and hot stuff we'll get into. People have been trying to optimize forever, though. One of my biggest fears in life, this is one of the things I <laughs> runs in my brain before I fall asleep every night. My biggest fear is being on my deathbed and knowing that I left some on the table. You know, not reaching that top form of yourself. What did you do here? What did you just waste your 80 years on this life doing? Did you optimize or did you not optimize? So you don't want to go around with this partial brain. You got to get that full sleep to realize what level you're operating at. So now what Matthew's going around touring and talking to doctors and now the government is doing is trying to regulate sleep in the trucker community, which has been going on for a while. And they tried implementing prophylactic naps via the FAA. And we touched upon before how pilots and the whole FAA community, everybody who's flying is usually sleep deprived and you have nothing to lock your internal biological clock onto. So what the FAA did one year was try to implement prophylactic naps, just a nap you have to take. But because obviously crashes happen when the pilots are drowsy as well. But when the pilots heard about this suggested prophylactic nap, they just laughed it out of the airport. I'm sure they just call it cruising altitude or autopilot. They just nap when the autopilot's going on positive and just say, hey, buddy, I'm going to knock out for a couple minutes. You good to make sure the computer keeps flying us? Yeah, not that big of a deal, bud. <laughs> they probably just prefer to get paid to nap on the clock rather than the FAA calling it a prophylactic nap and not having to pay them for a few more hours a day. So smart. The pilots unionized and they won there <laughs> and they're getting their sleep. So win win. Also, when you're sleep deprived, it's not just that you don't know you're tired. You also don't know that you're being emotionally irrational because lessening sleep induces negative emotional brain triggers. And this makes sense because your brain knows that you're not operating at 100%. So it revs up those flight or flight system. It's like, let's get ready to go. Everybody is on high alert because if we have to fight for our life, we are not at 100% right now. And so your, um, your negative emotional brain triggers are standing on the tip of their toes ready to act. And this is not a good way to live. You're just living in a constant state of anxiety when you're sleep deprived. And it's not just the negative emotions. It's harder to control emotions overall. And the way that Matthew was able to 
test this was they showed university students a bunch of pictures as the control group and then they showed sleep deprived students these pictures as well and when the sleep deprived students came across pictures of a puppy they started like irrationally crying or they got really angry when they saw a picture of like a toilet seat left up or something like that it's just things with no actual weight will set them off you know i put the toilet seat up when i have to pee you should have to put it down when you want to pee but no, feminism means men do more of the work, like we've been doing for millennia. So your serotonin levels are all out of whack. You don't know how to pick your battles and your emotions, your testosterone or your estrogen, because estrogen is, that's it. Emotions just come from different chemical reactions in the brain. So your amygdala deep in your brain is the emotional gas pedal. That's what is so hard to control when you don't sleep and is what revs up these negative emotions. It's your reptile brain. Our brain develops. It goes further out with the layers like an onion. The more developed we got deep down at the middle is the amygdala smallest reptile thoughts it controls when you're angry or when you're happy and the way that we are able to control our deep emotions is our ape prefrontal cortex our newly developed prefrontal cortex the rational brain your third eye right in between your eyeballs and this works best when you're well rested so when you aren't well rested you don't have control of your prefrontal cortex and that amygdala that gas pedal it's like a 16 year old taking the dad's ferrari out for a joy ride and you're going to be crying at the prom you're going to be <laughs> popping chubbies in the middle of the dance floor it's going to be a messy show if, if you're going around life with your amygdala in charge the chemical stratum is the thing that's in your prefrontal cortex that deals with risk and reward and then when you don't sleep it was showed that stratum piles up and it ties with dopamine so it makes you think that your crazy decisions are even better and it makes you reinforce risk taking as a good thing when you're sleep deprived also your fight or flight is on high alert which we went over so you're always fidgety and confrontational and so lack of sleep will make you swing to either extreme you'll be super anxious and fidgety oh someone's looking at me someone's looking at me and then bam what the fuck are you looking at man do we have a problem here no you are sleep deprived and impaired right now <laughs> go home and fall asleep so you gotta sleep if you want to be under control of this giant brain that you're holding the reins of all the time. And a lack of sleep to end this chapter on the sad parts of missing sleep. A lack of sleep can trigger manic or depressant episodes or other mental health episodes, which is obviously bad the older you get because it's more critical not to trigger these episodes. So sleep loss and mental illness are a two-way street. Like they feed into each other like this vortex, this negative feedback loop I'm talking about. If you're not acknowledging your anxiety and that you're playing this greatest hits of fear that you have in your life, you're going to keep playing it. You're not going to recognize it. It's going to keep you up at night and you're not going to be able to get sleep. You're going to be more tired. You're going to be more anxious. You're not going to be able to sleep the next night and so on and so on. You see this through sleep disorders, conjure mental illnesses like throughout the entire lifetime. 60% of people with Alzheimer's had or have a sleep disorder. There was a couple pages in the book about the causal link between low sleep and mentally degenerative diseases. So it's a catalyst for your brain. It tells you like, all right, we're not doing this anymore. Time to move on to the next incarnation. Time to end this here. We are not of use anymore. That's why you always have to convince yourself as a human that you have a purpose and that you're working towards something. And when you don't sleep, the brain kicks in these life-ending diseases like dementia, the forget everything, purge everything, dump all files, it's over. <laughs> and so we see that sleep will combat these degenerative brain disorders. And that's if it's not too late. Obviously, if it's everything's falling apart, putting a band-aid on a broken fender isn't going to do anything. But if you get there in time, enough band-aids will do the trick. And in NREM sleep, that super deep dead sleep that we have, Jilla, the little gyres, the grooves, the deep grooves in your brain, reduce 60% in size. So your brain actually shrinks when you sleep. So that all the lymphatic systems, all like all the cleaning chemicals get, can get in throughout your brain and clear out all the plaque. So deep to the scientific level, if you don't sleep, your brain doesn't shrink and it doesn't have time to take this chemical power hose and then plaque builds up so you are going around the world with a booger brain and booger brain turns to dementia it is very noticeable at the two eyes two ears level to see but measuring it on a chemical scale we see that sleep totally combats these diseases but humans are only able to see when it's too late and someone's already going crazy man so with better technology, better testing in the household, we're going to be able to catch on to things earlier like this and prevent 
the diseases we'll be talking about in chapter 8 here, which is chapter 8, cancer, heart attacks, and a shorter life. We learned from the health complications of truckers that, you know, the lack of sleep is a really nasty feedback loop for us and for other people that you'll probably kill on the road, and it leads to worse health complications. 80% overweight, 50% obese. That is complicated. And at the most extreme level, we're going back to Francis Crick and DNA. A lack of sleep shortens your telomeres. That shortens your lifespan. And maybe that of your future offspring as well will have shorter lifespans. You know, twins are the same exact people. Their DNA is 100% the same. I mean, humans have 99.8% DNA in common with bonobos. That's our closest relatives in the animal kingdom. But twins are literally 100%. They are an exact genetic copy. But throughout their life, the RNA gets different, and that's why twins will start to look different throughout their life. And their kids will be different. Two different twins' kids won't be twins. And this leads back to this, to Matthew's solution. If you had this, how could I have looked? You would fix your sleep patterns. If my twin got a full 10 hours every night and I only slept four hours and went out and boozed, I would have a real life version of, oh shit, this is what I would look like if I was doing everything this kid was. <laughs> Sometimes you wish you had a twin just so you had a control study to compare yourself to. And this chapter is also about health risks. Some facts Matthew sprinkled in were about how cardiovascular diseases increase by over 200% when you sleep less than six hours. You don't need to change your lifespan or anything. Even if you're just sleeping two hours less every single night, the chance that the heart attack will happen is increased by 200%. So you're putting your life at risk here. 7 million people a year die from hypertension, and we learned sleep loss exacerbates existing illnesses. 7 million people get heart attacks, and 200% more get heart attacks because they don't sleep. So it could be as low as 3 million people dying a year from heart attacks, but we don't value sleep. So there's compounding negative effects we have as society as well. And just like that example that we had of Greece before, heart attacks went up by 30% when they outlawed the afternoon siesta. Every single year on spring forward when we lose an hour of sleep, reported heart attacks increase nationwide at every single hospital because it's a strain on these older people's heart. It's increasing the chance that they're finally going to have this heart attack or something like that because you're jerking their clock forward twice a year by an hour. But that second time, the fall back, when you get an extra hour of sleep, heart attacks go down. No surprise there. Sleep is the cure. If you looked at everybody dies of a heart attack and sleep is the cure, when we prescribed an extra hour night's sleep one day a year, people literally live longer. <laughs> it's a fact. There's facts to this. <laughs> Damn, man. So that shows that all the heart problems there are to not sleeping. Also, when you don't sleep, though... In your veins, it's tougher to siphon out excess sugars, and this is what makes you hyperglycemic and pre-diabetic. A lot of reason those truckers are so overweight. It kidneys, your red blood cells are no longer good at filtering things out of the highways in your body. Like you got booger brains and dementia from not sleeping, you will get blood clots in your veins. And amounts of sugar start to pile up, which leads to hyperglycemia and then diabetes. And it's normal to have some sugar in your bloodstream. You have to. That's what humans run off of. But it becomes the new norm to have a shitload of sugar rushing around your system at all times. So also with weight gain here, coffee blocks the adenosine, remember? The thing that tells you that you're tired. But what coffee also blocks is the signal, I think it's called leptin, but that part wasn't in the book. But the signal that tells you when you're satiated by food is also blocked by coffee. And then that starts to build up as well, the leptin. So you get hungrier as well when you're not sleeping, leading to more diabetes and hyperglycemia. And even naturally in your circadian rhythm, when you're starting to get tired, sleep loss increases your endocannabinoids. So why you get that overtired feeling, why you feel more hungry, you are literally getting the munchies when you're tired. It makes you overtired and you might get a little giggly and hallucinate a tiny bit. That's if you go long enough without sleeping, your brain starts to get flooded with endocannabinoids. So even when you don't sleep, your brain does kind of start to flood with this weird bath and mixture of all these crazy drugs going together. So you're having this little party until you finally do fall asleep and regenerate to the working human that we're able to be. And if none of that's bad enough for you yet, that you might have a heart attack or that you're probably going to get diabetes or get fat if you stop sleeping, if you decrease your sleep by a lot, well... 
sleep also leads to lower testosterone productions and hormone productions in men, which obviously is not good for a sex life. Matthew was able to study this through the 20-year-old dudes <laughs> in the college, and he measured some scrotums there at UC Berkeley, and when you don't sleep, your ball sack shrinks, your testosterone goes down, and your actual extremities will start to shrink. And testosterone aids in energy and, more importantly, focus. This is what the male machine is run off of. And then females are run off of estrogen, their main hormone. We're these weird testosterone animals, and we definitely interface differently with the world than our hormonal estrogen counterparts that are females. But you gotta have both sides of the coins to make this all work, and we kind of have made this earth our bitch so far. So let's keep at it. We make a good team, ladies. And there I just said, dudes, your balls are gonna shrink if you don't sleep. I got a warning here for you women as well. There's a 20% follicular loss in females with a lack of sleep. So if you don't sleep, 20% of your hair could start to fall out. Your hair starts to thin. I know how big of a deal that is for women. Also, but this could be a plus for some chicks, there's an 80% reduction in fertility when you're sleep deprived, which is a joke. I definitely don't want kids right now in my life. You do see, though, older couples do have trouble conceiving, and this hasn't been a thing throughout history. <laughs> you used to shit out nine kids to help you live on the farm, but now people can't get pregnant anymore. Where is that coming from? A lot from the food we eat, but the lives we live, especially. Everybody is sleep deprived, women are sleep deprived, and you have an 80% less chance of being able to conceive if you're sleep deprived so if you're trying to reproduce you know everybody <laughs> in today's society everybody reproduces there's no respect paid to survival of the fittest or the actual best evolution of human genes everybody just gets to reproduce now but in order to reproduce in the wild and in today's society you literally have to be at your 100 percent your best self you have to be sleeping you have to be eating right you can't be drinking every night or the male's not going to produce sperm or the woman's not going to be releasing eggs sleep is super integral it's like your brain's subconscious regulator saying we're not ready to have kids yet you don't even know when to go to bed and you know half the things about having a newborn is taking care of their sleep schedule so that's a really cool little inhibitor that the human brain has in it if you're not sleeping enough you won't be able to reproduce and so let's finish this chapter about the negatives of no sleep and sickness if you drink too many nights in a row you'll have a drunk flu you just get like sick from being drunk. You didn't actually catch a virus or anything. You were just drunk for too long. Matthew talked about in the book, this what we call the drunk flu usually comes from multiple nights lack of sleep. And then sleep is what helps us fight cancer. Our biggest bully on the block right now, the humans, that's our black plague when they look back at the 21st century cancer. Sleep is what fights cancer though, and cancer is just a lack of regulation in cells. Cancer is a type of cell that is over-reproducing and it doesn't have that thing to tell it to stop reproducing. So that little thing in our brain I was talking about, cancer doesn't have that. So maybe humans are the cancer, the way we are destroying the earth like people destroy their bodies. That is a pretty good comparison. But correlation between lack of sleep and cancer was found in government third shift workers had a much higher risk for breast cancer. And then mice studies even showed that there's a 200% increased risk for cancer. So just like the heart attacks if you don't sleep. So there's all this stuff coming at you all the time. Life is basically just fighting off whatever diseases are encoded in your genes for as long as possible and then hopefully you don't pass those genes on to your next kid as well so what scientists are doing now is looking at telomeres and why they shorten over the lifespan that rna those little caps that keep your dna wound and keep you functioning as a human throughout your life how do we keep that from unraveling throughout the lifetime and in mice they have been able to reverse aging in mice you could look up some studies of this it's one of the craziest things in medical science right now and hopefully if you want to live forever or reverse your aging you're in luck you might be able to see something like that by the end of the 21st century so at the end of the sad chapter about smaller balls losing hair drunk flus and giving mice cancer at least we know throughout all this that sleep keeps us alive longer so if you want to live forever, sleep as much as you can now until they finally find out how to reverse the unraveling of the telomeres. And then we can live forever and listen to part three because this is about to be a long show. Part three here, how and why we dream about running simulations and making connections for short to long term memory, dreams, creativity and lucid dreaming. Chapter nine was called routinely psychotic. And just like I was saying, you had a newborn baby and you have to tell the parents 
your baby is going to pass out for eight hours every single day and be in a psychotic state. Well, while they are passed out in that coma for eight hours, they are not only paralyzed, but they are going through a psychotic break. When you are asleep, you classify for the big three that are considered a psychotic break. You're hallucinating, you're disoriented, and you're delusional. So every single night, every single one of us are certifiably insane. Welcome to my life. <laughs> it's going to be a shorter chapter, though, because we really don't know that much about dreams altogether still. It's a big mystery. So dreams take place in the MREM sleep. That is a narrative fuel dream. So the ones where you're moving around, you go on an adventure, there's a plot, there's something that you're trying to do maybe or trying to run away from. And a lesser known fact and what gets glazed over is that there is no dreaming and NREM sleep but technically your brain does kind of produce some floating images and stuff like that but as I was just saying there is no narrative you can just dream about an object in NREM sleep it just can't be that intense I guess or it would kick you out of that deep sleep meditative state and so how Matthew was able to study some of these things was the parts of your brain that are 30% more active in REM sleep than when you're even awake so like I was saying we might be smarter when we're asleep than we're awake your brain is 30% more active when you're asleep and you're awake your visual spatial cortex so your eyes you actually have supervision in your sleep in the dream world you could see through walls you see things in higher definition just like HGTVs. The human eye doesn't see at 1080 HP. We see at much worse. That's why it's kind of weird when we see the beads of sweat on people's face on TV. It's like, whoa, this is some alien shit in my living room, but I love it. That's why it's so entertaining. You actually see in this HD mode in your dreams. It's 30% more effective as well as your motor cortex. That's why you could leap from building to building. <laughs> Your hippocampus and also your emotional center, the amygdala, all of those are more active in your NREM sleeps. So even though your brain is more effective though, the brain on sleep is more like the brain when it's on Adderall. It's more efficient at one thing at a time. It can perform a certain task. Also, this chapter was able to show how MRI scans were able to predict some of the contents of dreams and this is the highest level the apex of dream research that we have right now <laughs> and i don't know if that's pathetic or impressive that the best that humans have is just this crude dream catcher but that's pretty creepy and impressive that they can produce a printed image of what you're dreaming while you're dreaming the video i watched on youtube because this wasn't enough just to read about. This guy had a dream about this weird gothic castle, and they printed this creepy black and white picture, and they showed him it as soon as he woke up, and he's like, where am I? What dimension is that? How did you... Did you were you guys following me in my dream? How did you know I was just at that church? And it was like, what is happening? It was some Black Mirror type of shit. And there was something about this in Black Mirror, if I remember correct. It was an episode about this guy that was committing a murder, and he's going to try to cover his tracks. So he goes into this lady's house, and he she witnessed the murder, so he has to kill her. And he kills her, but then the police show up to the scene of the crime where the lady's dead. And the hamster is still alive in the room. And since it's 2050, they have full technology to be able to photo image the hamster's memories. So they see the killer in the room. No, through the hamster's memory. So yeah, hamsters are going to be snitching on us in the future if we perfect this technology. It's just like Francis Crick, though, with the DNI, with the DNI, with the DNA spiral, and then predicting what NREM sleep is. It's putting this groundwork in so that future scientists like Matthew can extrapolate and do studies in their sleep labs, like measuring ball sacks or going into caves for two weeks at a time. All in the name of science, these men are heroes. Happy I brought up Francis Crick there, because that kind of leads us into this point. Because Crick's model is that NREM sleep dreaming is you just going over your actions and deciding what you want to throw out from what happened that day. But what Matthew found through his sleep studies is that it's not more events, but mostly emotions from that day will drip into a dream. Emotion is the secret sauce to memory. If you go back to your childhood, the earliest memories you have or the only memories you have are most likely going to be tied to some crazy intense emotions. And the most emotional times that you have in your life are going to be the most memorable. It's that secret sauce I'm talking about. And Matthew found that the emotions just drip into your dream and influence the way that your dream will go for that night. Like if you go and watch a scary movie, that emotion, the anxiety, the on edge feeling of ready to run, that fight or flight is going to be in your dream that night. 
even in just like a 300 person study he conducted on campus on top of the actual dream reports but 35 to 50 percent of participants reported emotional themes or occurrences from the previous day in dreams so if you have a dream journal people go read what that dream was and then you're gonna have to check your journal from the previous day to see what you did that day or if you're not a fucking psychopath that writes everything down like me, just pay attention to your dreams tonight. See if it's about a podcast host pissing you off. <laughs> because that's Matthew's hypothesis here, so prove us right. And that's going to bring us to the end of chapter 9, which was about routinely psychotic. How and why we dream. Continuing part 3 here now is chapter 10, dreaming <clears throat> dreaming as overnight therapy. So dreams are a byproduct of REM sleep like heat from a light bulb. You can't have your REM sleep with your eyes running around and all those chemicals in your brain without also creating a dream. It's just like in order to light up your room, the light bulb is going to get hot. And conversely, you can't get proper REM sleep without dreams. So again, that's another <laughs> anomaly. They both feed back into each other. And remember, REM sleep and dreams are best for emotional control, creativity, and digesting information from that day are its main functions. And that's what this chapter is going to be about. During that long period while you are unconscious, noradrenaline is pumped into your brain during REM sleep. And noradrenaline's chemical function, in a way, is able to surpass anxiety. So just like with the adenosine, the way it blocks certain receptors or like the drug molly will block your serotonin receptors so that it all piles up from your brain for a while and then afterwards there's a big serotonin depletion and these people get super sad well when you're in your dream you finally have this noradrenaline being pumped around and that's why you're so fearless and superior in your dreams you're willing to jump from the building or run away from whatever giant monsters chasing you when in real life you see it with soldiers on the battlefield like in vietnam the men they were shooting at they would shoot above their head or the kids pissing their pants when they started getting shot at for the first time. If you had this noradrenaline pumping through your system or things like pro vigil or a hardcore stimulant, that's what they give fighter pilots. And I don't even know what kind of dope drugs our Navy SEALs are on, but the noradrenaline is a great example here. And we find it in nature only in our dreams. So REM sleep gives you this cop-out for anxiety that anything in your past also could have just been a dream. I remember when I used to work at that supermarket for like a couple of years when I was 16, there was this 80-year-old woman that would come in and it sounded like she was, she had like a baby's voice and she was screaming like, ah, ah, extremely loud. How disturbing was that to just hear me make that noise? Imagine like an 80 year old lady getting up in your face and all this type of stuff that creeped me out. But relying that you're <laughs> what I'm telling myself here now is that this lady was just a figment of my imagination in my REM sleep. So the point Matthew's trying to make is exactly what I just did to, <laughs> to get this character from haunting my every waking moment for the rest of my life. Your brain can do these mental gymnastics where you go, oh, that didn't really happen. That was just a dream. And it's like giving you that break throughout the 24 hour day and you also have a built-in cop out as well because the human memory really isn't that good the more we study the human memory it's kind of just like you have memories of memories from the past so it's not exactly how you remember things happening you just remember how you remember them or how you tell the story which is kind of sad <clears throat> that's why i write things down every day i keep that daily journal and then at the end of the year when i read that thing i feel like i'm in whatever day when you have details of the whole day, details about your emotion, remember emotions are the secret sauce for memory, you can just transport your brain back into that moment. It's a pretty cool exercise. That's what you do in dreams here, and that's what REM sleep gives you the opportunity and cop out to do as well. And then when you don't sleep, you don't get that noradrenaline bath, and then you're twice as anxious the next day. So again, the anti-sleep vortex is sucking at you again from every end. Some of the other ways emotions reoccur in your brain is that if you bring up something that happened before the same emotions will arise currently so in the morning if i dropped my oatmeal on the ground and then at the end of the day i was <laughs> i watched someone on tv get their lunch tray slapped out of their hands i will probably get angry watching this piece of media because i'm relating my day to it because there's a direct emotional correlation in my brain from today and then when you go to sleep just like that noradrenaline buffer and that <laughs> like i can 
convince myself that that lady was a figment. When you sleep, the next morning when you wake up and you see someone else drop their oatmeal, the sleep acts as a buffer and your brain goes, yo, we already dealt with this. You don't need to get mad about this. It's logged into long-term memory we learned. Don't get mad. So sleeping regulates your emotions. Your subconscious brain is so smart. It just kind of like takes control for you a little bit more. It guides you in the right direction is a better way to put it. And this is going to bring us towards the latter half of chapter 10 here. Without dreaming reality can seem too continuously clear and then lead to depression just like i'm saying you need this sleep buffer or else your life would drag on forever it would be just one long march when you never get a real break like the break that sleep is (laughs) and sleep wouldn't really be that great if you didn't dream you think oh i just want to knock out for the night and not have to go on these more adventures because i'm so tired from today but imagine your head hit the pillow at night and then it's just morning That's how some people report sleeping on sleep medication will feel, and then you wake up a little bit drowsy as well. And that's almost just as bad. If if you just closed your eyes for a split second and then it was morning again, you wouldn't actually feel like you got your rest. It would just be that continuous life where you never get a break that I'm trying to portray. So even if you forget 99% of these little sideshows that your brain gives you that are the dreams, they need to just play their course so that your brain can have this VR space play around while it takes its bath. Otherwise, you'll wake up and your emotions will be out of whack and your brain will look like a raisin all dry and not ready for the day. And when your emotions are out of whack, you can't tell other people's emotions. When we were going over, I took anatomy and psychology. There are thousands of muscles in the human face. We have to remember every muscle in the human body, but not in the face because there were just so many that we you can't remember them all. Our teacher would say it's like a class in itself to learn about the muscles of the human face. There are so many muscles in your face, it's so intricate, the tiny micro expressions that you give off, sometimes knowingly, like you raise an eyebrow if you didn't hear what somebody said, or you smirk if you want to make someone feel good. But your brain subconsciously reads these micro expressions down to the primate brain. You have a reptile brain that will recognize when other people are angry, but our prefrontal cortex is picking up even smaller cues. All those little tricks, like if you approach a group of people and you're trying to get into their conversation, but they don't open up their feet towards you, they're probably just trying to keep on talking with themselves. They don't want you to be a part of it. At work even, dude, if they start to copy your body language, you know that they are listening to you. That is a really common one. Just put your hand on your chin and the other person will usually do it too. It's like if you just start talking to someone and you hand them something, they will always take it because your brain automatically just takes things that people are handing to you it's like a it's like a magician trick it's um it's the hand of distraction (laughs) if you're sleep deprived you'd be a really good audience member at a magic show because you're not picking up on any of these tiny micro communications that we're doing So dreaming really is an overnight therapy because it regulates those emotions and ability to read other people's emotions and that is going to bring us to chapter 11 here dream creativity and dream control that's right who wants to get into their vr space not just their brain messing around in there that's why i originally bought this book because i wanted to learn how to (laughs) to be leonardo dicaprio in inception but there was only a chapter on it and the main point is that it's still a really big mystery and only like 30 percent of people know how to lucid dream so mendeleev got the idea for the periodic table from a dream He would just have like 80-something cards, a deck of cards that had all the different elements. That's all that we knew existed at the time. Now there's over 200-something elements that we're aware of. But Mendeleev would just spend all day shuffling this deck around on the table trying to make sense of all these elements. How are these related to the others? Because they couldn't see how many electrons were on each atom. That makes it a lot easier for us. But there are billions of of combinations in a deck of cards some crazy like the normal 52 deck of cards if you shuffle it an infinite amount of times there's more stars in our galaxy i don't even know how that's possible it's just one of those like 52 times 52 52 times whatever yep this is why i failed pre-calc but when you dream just like mendeleev did and we've been saying today dreams connect all this prior knowledge into various pathways in your brain and night by night it'll eventually compile things into an efficient chart and your brain will eventually stick with one of these charts and so Mendeleev literally just woke up one day and knew to put all of the noble gases on the right side and that hydrogen was on the top left 
almost like that knowledge is seeping through the dream world from another dimension. Ooh. But there's other people that have stories just like this. Paul McCartney said that let it be and yesterday came to him in his sleep. He was just dozing off and the chords came to him and he just rolled out of bed and grabbed his guitar real quick. Da Vinci, if you ever go read a thing about his sleeping patterns, it was crazy. He like wouldn't sleep for three days at a time. Just every two hours, he would take a 20 minute nap and he would do that for three days. And so he would be waking up from these crazy REM sleep dreams. And that's how he'd get these inventions like the helicopter, the armored tanks in 1500, the flying machine. If you're able to incorporate these, just like Mendeleev and Paul McCartney, these crazy drugs that are flooding your brain when you sleep, and as soon as you come out and you're in that groggy creative period, these people found a way to capitalize on it. That's like um, Thomas Edison has the craziest one of these. He had what was called like the dream machine, and he tied a thing to his wrist, and every time he started to fall asleep, his wrist would go limp. And it would pull like, you know, a ball would roll down a hill and then it would knock over some dominoes and they would light a switch on fire. And then a bell would ring in his ears every 10 minutes when he would actually start to fall asleep. And then the chemicals like the dimethyltryptamine is released into your brain. And then he would wake up with the ideas from the dream. So he was basically torturing himself, but he has like the most patents in U.S. history. And then Keith Richards also guitarist for the rolling stones the opening riff one of the most <laughs> noticeable opening riffs of all time for satisfaction <laughs> youtube will get me for that because i just hummed it so well that riff came to keith richards in his sleep but then he said it unlike paul mccartney he slept for another 40 minutes and was just like all right now i'll get up grab my guitar and then he just played it as soon as he woke up pretty damn cool so sleep inertia is a real thing. That's the term Matthew used for it. And that means dreams carry over to that groggy creative period in the morning. And when Matthew was testing people, they found that for 90 minutes after waking, you have a creative boost in solving things like anagrams or that test from outliers. They have like an IQ test for creativity. And so if you do it within 90 minutes of waking up, you're going to be doing it better. Just like I said before, two hours after you wake up, do those SATs four hours after you wake up go break a world record so you have this creative boost in the morning where your brain is still using deductive thinking so let me break this down a little bit for you when you're awake you're just being basically asked questions all day or solving little riddles that's what your job is hopefully you can break any job down into those descriptions like we did last month we are using deductive reasoning all day. You're taking all the knowledge you know and filtering it down into one answer that you could give to someone or solve whatever piece of work that you're working on. But REM sleep uses inductive reasoning. It's like that backwards Google algorithm I was saying our brain has before. It starts with an object and then with a dream, you create an entire story and reality around it. <laughs> it's so sweet man i'm getting goosebumps it's so cool how this works it's one of the only times unless you're actually sitting down to do a writing exercise look man you watch netflix you play video games you tweet something that's all deductive you're breaking it down trying to win a game get likes but when you're writing or creating something it's the dream start in that nrem period with just an object and then it builds and builds and builds and builds and gets more creative and crazier and that's why when you wake up, you still have that sleep inertia, that awesome, <laughs> that awesome apex brain is still going. This is why you're told to sleep on a problem. That's one of the longest running cliches of the human form. Sleep on it. In France, they say sleep with the problem because when you wake up, you will have, you know, wrestled around with it. Your brain does that inductive thinking and you may create a new solution you wouldn't have thought of before. One of the earlier chapters, we were saying when you wake up, you have memories that you don't even remember that you had. And when you sleep with a problem, you wake up with solutions you might not have had before. And a brain that doesn't have adenosine in it, and you're tripping off these awesome creative drugs. And wrapping up this cooler chapter, Matthew compared our brains to that of a computer a little bit. And he says the difference between our mind and a computer is that in REM sleep, our brain is has interlinked files and tries to consolidate everything and this is like what a smart computer or artificial intelligence once we have it would do like having all these 
<laughs> I have like 50 folders and just like free write files out on my dashboard and my computer. A smart computer, or if you actually use your brain, so do a smart brain for a day, is able to create these new interlinked patterns or processes of organization where a computer is only able to, you know, <laughs> retain what it's given. Matthew uh, tested this in his sleep study <laughs> in his sleep basically a sleep torture chamber with all these experiments he's doing they designed a maze and participants who took a nap and then went back in the maze were able to get much further that's like the movie the maze runner he would sleep for the night and as soon as he woke up the maze doors would open and he'd get in there as soon as he memorizes it and they get further every day or if you've never seen that movie maybe you went to the liberty science center or some sort of museum and they had a touch tunnel I was always too much of a pussy to go in there because my biggest fear is pretty much claustrophobia, I think. Well, aside from, you know, not reaching any of my goals and, uh, you know, leaving some on the table on my deathbed. But claustrophobia is a big one. And they would have these, you're basically crawling through an air duct. And it was a maze where you had to touch around and try to make it outside the maze without using your eyeballs. So that's a big no from me. But if you take a nap before you do one of these touch tunnels or mazes or spelunkings like those guys did in chapter one, you're going to make it a lot further on a well-rested brain. And if you can't lucid dream people, I got bad news for you. It's only 20% of people that can lucid dream. But don't feel so bad because what Matthew was able to find out was that their sleep paralysis isn't as strong. So while it might be an advantage that they get to go play around and hang out with, you know, the coolest figures of all time in their brain every single night, <laughs> their sleep paralysis isn't as strong. So if we were still sleeping in trees like monkeys, they would fall out while they're having these awesome dream adventures and trying to run around, but they're actually just in a dream. And then they get eaten by hyenas, so who's laughing then? So scientists are still trying to discover and look further into how we can lucid dream. But we just don't know yet, unfortunately, is Matthew's point. So <laughs> so maybe we'll have a book around that specific topic in the future. But this whole part, part three, was really just about dreams being good for regulating emotions and for creativity. And this is going to bring us to part four. We're in the home stretch, ladies and gentlemen. This is from sleeping pills to society transformed. Sleep disorders and non-drug therapies and reconnecting humans with sleep. So let's kick it off with chapter 12, things that go bump in the night, creative name for just a chapter about sleepwalking. And you know what the real word for sleepwalking is? Somnibalism. So definitely keep calling that sleepwalking. It's much cuter. The few things that you do or can do in your sleep are somnibalism, so sleepwalking, or paralysis, which is the normal thing. You're paralyzed in your sleep. You can lucid dream, which you're not as paralyzed. You twitch a lot more, but you get to go on these cool adventures. Or you can get abducted by aliens. So you know a lot happens when your head hits the pillows. And Matthew did give us an, an explanation for all the alien abductions that are reported mid-sleep. And this chapter 12 also started with a cool little story, if you wanted to read the book, about the act of killing someone in your sleep is not always a punishable crime. There were a couple disgruntled marriages that they talked about. If your doctor is willing to testify for you and prove that you do have uh, somnibalism issues, then you can get off with murdering your spouse. You're welcome, everybody. I just gave you all a freebie. So this sleepwalking somnibalism also does include driving, cooking, eating, homicides, sex, all that can happen while you're unconscious. But what you would really need, like a plea of insanity in order to get off, would be to prove that you have insomnia, not just that you're sleep deprived. Like if you were just looking at your phone every single night and weren't getting to sleep, you wouldn't have grounds for defense in a court. So don't murder your husband or wife just yet. Let's learn a little bit about insomnia first so you could get that doctor's note. Insomnia is is your physical body not being able to produce sleep and cannot stay asleep. Sleep onset and maintenance insomnia is when it's harder to get and harder to stay asleep. And that's like the Billy Crystal bit, the famous one. I sleep like a baby. I wake up every hour. Big laughs, big laughs. <laughs> so if you're dying to say you're an insomniac, so you could brag to the internet or at work in the office, real insomniacs, you will get a full night's sleep but you do not feel rested at all. But if you're just dying, you know, to 
tell everyone I'm such an insomniac. I didn't sleep at all. I cannot sleep. There is a such thing called hypochondriacal insomnia, which is when you convince yourself that you can't sleep. I mean, anything is possible. Placebos, I can convince myself I don't have cancer. There are some miracle cases. You can convince yourself you have insomnia if you really want to brag about it that hard. And that's what scientists and doctors like Matthew called hypochondriacal insomnia. And also another loophole, insomnia, though, cannot be a cause of something else. So, like, if you're overweight, you can't really be an insomniac because you probably just have sleep apnea. And actual sleep apnea is due to an overactive sympathetic nervous system linked to insomnia. So that's another feedback loop and vortex. But you don't just get sleep insomnia from being overweight. Overweight-induced insomnia comes from sleep apnea from the sympathetic nervous system. That's like an autoimmune disease. It's not just from eating Cheetos. And 1 in 10 Americans actually do have insomnia where it's not induced by weight issues, sleep hygiene issues, technology issues, or just, just fucking discipline, dude. Throw your phone across the room, black your shades out, and close your eyes on your pillows for five minutes. If you are not asleep by then, you probably didn't make the day your bitch. And that's why you're still asleep, because you're freaking out about it. So this overactive sympathetic nervous system. Autoimmune disease. You're hearing big about it now. That's why people go gluten-free. It just means that your body is attacking itself because it's identifying itself as an outside agent, which is productive in the cases of cancer, but it's identifying your nose as a cancer, and it'll get rid of your nose. That's not a real disease. I'm sure it's a real disease out there if you want to worry yourself that your nose is falling off. <laughs> So the sympathetic nervous system is always watching your back. And that's kind of what somnibalism or sleepwalking is. So you could see how an overactive sympathetic nervous system would have been advantageous on the plains of Afri Africa because you would always have someone watching you while you slept, which is why humans have different sleep patterns because we work the best as a 100 to 200 person tribe. So someone's always up watching each other's back. And even in a smaller tribe, if you have a one out of 10, someone with a sympathetic nervous system, they will be up in the middle of the night watching for you. But it's no longer advantageous in this born to be bred office worker human version that we are now just like adhd is a huge advantage in nature because you're always on your toes but in an office you're prescribed meth which is one atom off you know adderall is only one atom off from meth if you look at the organic you know organic chemistry the breakup of molecules it ain't far off so yeah and things like insomnia aren't necessarily a bad thing you would just sleep at different periods of the day then there's things like narcolepsy, though, which is excessive sleepiness and that's an issue if you're falling asleep all the time in the middle of a lion chase. And a lot of narcoleptics <laughs> admit to sleep paralysis. So this is what explains those alien abductions. Sleep paralysis. I've had it before. It was one of the scariest nights of my life. It's like worse than a childhood nightmare, which I still vividly remember some of my childhood nightmares. Luckily, I'm not a narcoleptic, though, because patients describe it as living with no emotions. You exist rather than live, which is also how a lot of people taking antidepressants describe those medications. It takes away the highs and the lows. It just makes you able to get through to survive rather than thrive and emotions are what make life worth living. You know, even when you shed a tear or you're feeling really bad. Sometimes that puts a smile on my face to know that it could be that bad just to just to know you can feel that much of an emotion. <laughs> I guess maybe that's just like an addict thought or something. But there's some science behind it. Emotions are what your brain marks as achievement throughout the timeline that is your life. Just like the secret sauce for memory. And it cements in your brain throughout long periods of time what you should avoid and what you should try again. But being an emotionless human, sleeping too much like a narcoleptic or on antidepressants, is just like being an emotionless robot. But you got this fancy meaty robot. So that's kind of cool. <laughs> so live it up a little bit. Don't be emotionless, you know? Narcolepsy usually emerges between 10 and 20. Wipe that sweat off your brow, people, if you're missing it. If you have narcolepsy, sorry, we got medication out there, though. And it stems from a problem with your central nervous system. It just needs to shut down more frequently throughout the day. And while you're more frequently shut down, these narcoleptics also get hit harder with that paralysis drug. And people slip into sleep paralysis, which is fucking terrifying. 
it was my sophomore year of college, so when I was like 19, and it was always Sunday nights after weekends of heavy drinking. It only happened like five-ish times, but you're helpless because there are paralyzing agents in your brain. You cannot move. What I remember seeing was the most reported thing is a face in the corner of the room. I was sleeping in a bunk bed and I would like drape a sheet down. So, you know, it was a dope little cavern that I had and I would see this floating face in the top right corner because I was bottom bunk, just like floating in little circles staring at me. And then one of the scarier ones I remember was really vivid. It was like an iPhone was being held an inch from my face and I couldn't move. I felt like I was trying to look to my left, which is where our bathroom was, but I could not stop staring at what looked like an iPhone in front of my face. It was like scrolling pages on Instagram of just pictures of hands. And some of them were cartoon hands. Some of them were deformed hands. They were all different colors, closer, further, and just hands in my face. And I couldn't move. There was this face in the corner staring at me and then hands close up. Dude, it was terrifying. Close your eyes and try to imagine that. You're not going to want to. It was that bad. But these people are having this every single night. And then the third sign of narcolepsy is cataplexy. So it kind of happens during the daytime too. Their muscles will just turn to jello. And like the narcoleptics are living on this much more baseline level of emotions, the cataplexy happens when the person experiences something big enough to elicit a large emotion. So like if your kid had a big birthday or you had a big job interview, your amygdala is taken every day off in a beach chair when you have narcolepsy, but it gets whipped back. You know, an epiphanous moment hits you and it wakes that amygdala up. And for these people who don't experience these motions enough, the cataplexy kicks in and you turn into jello. It's crazy. That's a scary one. If you think you're a narcoleptic, that's your obvious third sign there. Matthew talked about in the book, they kept track of this one guy who had rapid onset narcolepsy don't know how it happened sorry but within six months he aged rapidly and then at the end he couldn't sleep for 11 days for whatever reason even though he was a narcoleptic all he could do was sleep and then he just went 11 days without sleeping and died his brain just flipped the switch so it's dangerous obviously and that's matthew's example and his point getting towards the end of the chapter is that we shouldn't be combating narcolepsy with amphetamines because they're addictive and dirty. So Adderall is notoriously dirty because Adderall is, like I said, it's a couple of atoms off of meth and it's cut with salt is what Adderall means. Ritalin is a little bit of a cleaner form of the amphetamine and then Provigil is one of the most pure forms on the market. And so then it's the most pure, or as Matthew calls, clean version. But all the amphetamines are addictive. So although Provigil's cleaner, all amphetamines are addictive. And I said before, Provigil is what, you know, fighter pilots are given before they're going on like a 12-hour haul. And what our near first lizard, I mean first lady, <laughs> Hillary Clinton, takes every single day. Bitch is methed out 24-7. Yeah, what a powerful woman. <laughs> because she's on the same drugs Hitler was taking every day. But this is a real-life narcoleptic that we all know. Hillary Clinton, that's why she has fainted multiple times in public and has seizures because she is a narcoleptic and she's prescribed Provigil and amphetamine. And obviously, it's not helping her. It's just suppressing the narcolepsy, which is Matthew's point that we shouldn't be treating it that way in our society. And we're talking about narcolepsy and the whole book is saying how sleep is so good for you. So then is sleeping too long bad for you? Well, most studies say yes, but that's because the people that they're studying usually have pneumonia or are dying, which is why they're sleeping 10 hours a day. So let me break that down a little bit better. Like if a study says 75% of people who sleep 10 plus hours a day are at higher risk of dying. Well, yeah, because... People who are dying of diseases sleep longer, so they're obviously grouped into that statistic. And then people, let's be honest here, people who are sleeping for 10 plus hours a day aren't the biggest go-getters out there, and they probably don't <laughs> they probably don't keep in the fittest shape either. So that's why you don't live as long also if you sleep as long. So our statistics are a little bit skewed about longer sleep period throughout the life. 
but deeper sleep studies Matthew did on like healthy individuals showed that it slows down your metabolism and increases hyperoxia, which is oxygen in the brain. So your chance of stroke can go up. If you're old, you don't want to sleep too long. Even if you're young, it slows down your metabolism sleeping too long. So if you really like to eat, this is not a good idea for you. Some people can't stomach food though, so they probably sleep a lot longer too. And if you just look at any sorts of just google like sleep throughout the lifespan amount studies it just shows a backwards j shape so after nine hours of sleep more sleep than that per night isn't healthy it'll start to counteract but if you look at any sort of graph about food about water it'll show this backwards j shape it's beneficial until you start abusing it there was that radio contest where a guy went on whoever could drink the most water wins and one of the guy drowned himself live on air he drank too much water so water can kill you. The thing that you need to keep you alive and we're 80% made out of, you can OD on water. You can also not overdose on sleep. That would be pretty dope. <laughs> he never came back. He was sleeping so hard. But it, it doesn't lead to the most efficient lifestyle. We're talking about optimization and efficiency today. So extrapolate a bit. You guys could do the works. <laughs> you guys could do some brain thinking so the show could be a little bit thorter. Thorter. Shorter. And this will bring us to the end of, point of chapter 12. Point being here, through all these lifestyle studies about narcolepsy, sleepwalking, all these crazy things, these people who sleep 10 hours a day aren't exactly taking the same time to treat their body like a temple or even a machine that they're going to use to walk around this earth for 80 years. A lot, of people <laughs> a lot of people treat their body like a landfill on fire. And it shows. So sleep hygiene. Sleep hygiene will keep you away from things like somnambulism a hyper sympathetic nervous system, insomnia, narcolepsy, alien abductions, sleep, and you will be saved. Chapter 13 here, iPads, factory whistles, and nightcaps. This is a fun chapter. It's about what's keeping us up now more than ever. There's all these artificial lights and LED screens. We have a regularized temperature, which throws our circadian rhythm off. Caffeine, obviously. Alcohol and punching clocks. All of these are jacking us up, the human animals that we are. And this chapter started with a nice little story. 255 Pierce Street, Lower Manhattan, Edison gave birth to the 24-hour night, and humans could finally colonize the night. So although he stole the idea from the light bulb, Edison was an implementer. And that's really what an entrepreneur is. You don't have to, oh, I'm so entrepreneurial, I have all these ideas. Those are pipe dreams until you put them into motion. You gotta be an implementer to be an entrepreneur. So even Thomas Edison, who was one of the biggest, <laughs> one of history's biggest thieves, winners write history he goes down as the biggest entrepreneur because he was a hustler he, it's not just the ideas even though he did have that crazy wake up idea machine you gotta you gotta put the work in it's not just the ideas edison helped us colonize the night though and humans are visual creatures it takes one third of our brain power throughout the day just goes to our visual cortex so you can imagine now that we have lights People just used to go to sleep with the sunset. Maybe you light a candle and turn the radio on for 10 years while that was a thing. But really, human beings, what we are as people, our genetic makeup, we go to sleep. That's why our circadian rhythm, we go to sleep when the sun sets. But now we are extending the amount of time that we're using our eyes to function. Whereas when you were around the campfire, you were just using your ears when it got too dark. Maybe zone out and watch the fire dance around, but you're using your ears to converse and listen to the music. David got into metro living a little bit because, you know, the name of the chapter is iPads, factory whistles, and nightcaps. So he was talking about New York City, and it is proven living in a metropolitan that big to take years off your lifespan. Not only, it's like living inside of a giant iPad. In Times Square, you are surrounded by LEDs 24-7. If you live anywhere close to there, the light pollution is insane. And even if, if you're on the East Coast time zone, Matthew described it that if you just spend two hours a night on your iPad, most Americans are up to four hours of screen time a day. So this is half of what most people are doing. If you're up till 11 o'clock, you've already dragged your biological clock back to Pacific time. So that's why that hack the around the world in 80 days is good if you don't want to sleep for 80 days. <laughs> And then artificial light can imitate sleep onset insomnia. So that disease where it makes it harder for you to fall asleep. Looking at iPads and LEDs too often increases 
the likelihood that you are going to suffer from that. But if you're in a blacked out room on a mattress after 14 waking hours with no phone, it would be pretty hard to stay awake. I'm talking about just for me because I can't talk on anyone else's behalf, but if we're being truthful here, if you go and have a hard ass workout that day, it's difficult to lay down somewhere and not fall asleep if you were actually beat, if you put the mental energy and the physical energy in that day. I remember as a teenager, I would sleep with my phone under my pillow. Those early flip phones, they would vibrate at a 0.2 magnitude earthquake. So I was always waking up. It was like the opposite of an alarm clock. I would fall asleep, wake up, fall asleep, wake up. And it was, you know, just so I could flex and try to pretend, yo, what's up, girl? I'm not sleeping yet. <laughs> <laughs> you know all that light skin type of stuff it's stupid i was affecting my sleep pattern on a growing brain and so when you're putting in that work you should have that sigh of relief at the end of the night when you get to finally take that stupid phone screen out of your face for at least eight hours and Matthew did talk about a little bit in the book the, how dangerous it is that we do this thing where you just wake up and instinctually look at your phone. It's just wasting that adrenaline boost that your body gives you as soon as you wake up. And also, too many artificial lights. We're talking about living in this iPad that is New York. Too many artificial lights can't you cannot release melatonin anymore. So then this shushes that prefrontal cortex. So back a couple chapters, you can't tell when you're tired now. And so it's just a, po a negative feedback loop, that vortex sucking you into shitty sleep hygiene. And this part of the chapter was crazy because it's about iPads a little bit and there's a such thing as a digital hangover. Matthew was able to test in people measuring melatonin levels. And after you use too much technology, you feel like you just spent 10 hours out boozing. There are, though, these new anti-blue LED glasses. I've only seen a bit around on the internet, so I can't talk too much about it. But it makes it so that melatonin can be released in your brain. You don't fall back a couple... You don't actually fall back a couple sleep time zones as well. And here's a cool thought I had while reading. Screens are the biggest drug in our society because they are chemically addictive. So I'm considering it a drug. You don't ingest it, but it's chemically addictive. And you even hear doctors nowadays saying that <laughs> screen time now is going to be looked at like smoking in the future. And it's gross if you walk around a mall or a park, just how many people are staring into their lap. If you took someone from the 80s and put them in this year, they would be like, oh my god, what is this thing everyone's looking at? This must be the best thing in the world. And you know, iPhones kind of are the best thing in the world, but this has been my whole life. I would have probably an even bigger epiphanous moment about that. But I was born into instant messages were already being sent by the time I came out of the womb. <laughs> For now, though, it doesn't really bother me that everyone's obsessed with screens because, you know, I'm a meme dealer. <laughs> and everyone's obsessed with Instagram, so I'm pushing my product on Instagram. It's perfect right now. Everybody, keep go binging Harry Schwant. We're at 7 point, what is it? 7 point something thousand followers growing constantly pushing the envelope i had a banned meme this month i was making fun of how i can't bring a 50 pound bag onto a plane but a guy can weigh 600 pounds and block the middle aisle seat like a fire hazard but people think i'm bullying fat people people who are eating themselves to death so they don't see the humor in that but that don't stop us we still growing we still out here hairy shit ain't going anywhere we gonna keep dealing those memes and keep you addicted to the screens hairy shit for life so back to sleep when you're staring at these screens it's also shushing that prefrontal cortex you're not combining your full emotional with the rational brain you're acting out of impulse when you're scrolling most of the time and sometimes i can attest it feels like 3 a.m is the best time to write ideas are just flowing out of you and you're just zoned in you're just in a flow state it's zoned in at this keyboard with your fingers going a mile a minute and you might be thinking you're not tired and you might actually get a second wind but you're probably setting your sleep schedule off for another couple of weeks because even on the weekends you're supposed to wake up at your regu your regularly scheduled time which is a bummer but that's the price you got to pay for optimization so let's move into alcohol a little bit booze you got an experienced host <laughs> for this part of the show Alcohol totally surpasses REM sleep, so you get zero of the benefits of unloading your hard drive when you fall asleep that night if you have booze in your system. You literally do sleep like a rock. You don't get any benefits. You just pass out on your mattress for eight hours. You know, people piss 
the bed. Let's talk about somnambulism. You could cook in your sleep. You could make love in your sleep. You could go for a run in your sleep. Well, people pee in their sleep too. And there's also this thing. It shows you how scary of a drug of a drug alcohol is. You turn into a zombie if you do enough. You're not in control of your brain. That's the worst kind of zombie. And then also coming off of alcohol relating with sleep because you don't REM sleep while you're on alcohol. This thing called delirium tremens happen when you're coming off of the booze and you'll start to mildly hallucinate while you're awake. And it's because this dimethyltryptamine and other sleep chemicals rush back into your brain because it's trying to make up for all this time that you weren't asleep. And so you basically start sleeping while you're awake, which is why it's like being drunk while you're awake. The uh, studies that Matthew did, he has college students, so it was pretty easy to work on these studies. There was a week-long experiment he did where some kids went out drinking a couple nights a week, and they remembered less info, even though the women had two shots and the men only had three shots apiece. So this isn't like they were going out getting hammered, black out drunk, where another thing, blacking out isn't that you don't remember anything, it's that your brain you've drank so much that your brain literally cannot process memories anymore. So you're on autopilot when you're blacked out. It's not that you're making all these memories and then in the period of sleep it just disappears. No, you're a walking zombie robot when you're blacked out and you cannot make memories. So arguably, are you even yourself if you're not making memories? Because if you upload your consciousness, it's just your mem POV, your, your memory point of view that's being uploaded. And some people consider that themselves. We'll read Heavens on Earth eventually. That's all about uploading your consciousness and shit. Real fun book, real good stuff to look forward to here on Nick's Nonfiction. Just being asleep when you're boozed up. You're not even making memories when you're that heavy boozed, and obviously then you're not going to be able to do this higher function of the human brain, which is REM sleep. That's totally out of the question. And then one of the even scarier things about Matthew's study here was that even though these kids learned all the facts for the experiment while they were sober, your brain still is studying in REM sleep for you. So you don't solidify these facts if you don't sleep sober, which sucks. <laughs> so even just getting a little bit drunk, having a couple drinks after a day of studying or a test review, not getting hammered, just getting tipsy. Retention drops by over 50%, Matthew found. Boo. <laughs> so even when you get drunk, your brain thinks it's okay to take a day off too, unfortunately. But you can't be too mad because every night when you go to sleep and you're taking the night off, your brain's on 24-7. So you actually are just giving your brain that final rest when you want to booze up. <laughs> but your brain is an arresting machine. Post-booze now, to fall asleep will go back into core temperature a little bit. Your body temperature, the, the way they measure it by rectum, your core temperature has to drop from 2 to 3 degrees Fahrenheit. And this is why you're always putting your hands and your feet and your head outside of the blanket because your hands, head, and feet are the best vents in your body. They have the most intricate vein systems so you can perspire more. When you sleep, this book also said, you wake up a pound lighter usually because you evaporate a, a pound of water precipitates out of you every night when you sleep you get really dehydrated that's why oh, one of the best tasting things on earth night water fuck a cold beer fuck a chocolate milkshake night water when you wake up and your mouth is like a desert oh yeah let that rain wash over me baby and even that puts you back to sleep better because Ice water increases your metabolism because it drops your core body temperature. You try to shake to warm back up. But if you want to sleep instead of lose weight, that's perfect. Drink some ice water in the middle of the night. And that's why you keep your hands and your feet out. There's no monsters coming for you. You're just trying to let some heat out under this little human pizza pocket that you've made that is your bed. And so temperature for doctors trying to cure sleep onset insomnia changing the temperature of your room is the easiest way to get people to fall asleep quicker you know this when it's it's starting to get hot out you're going to play with your buddies you come home at the end of the night sweating you take a hot shower because cold showers bug you out you got to burn the grime off of you <laughs> and then you get out of the shower your uh, core body temperature drops but you got a pump going all the heat is in your epidermis at your skin but it's late spring and your mom won't turn on the AC yet. Falling asleep those nights are the hardest. You will be up for an extra few hours because you're perspiring. You can't drop your body that two to three required degrees is in order to fall asleep. So I'm about to end the, the age-old couple's argument. 
teasing it a little bit first. At the beginning of the chapter, we said it's your circadian rhythm doesn't vibe with the fact that it's always this artificial 72 degrees. Whereas when we were living out in nature, it gets colder every night when the temperature drops and the sun goes down, your body knows it's time to fall asleep. But when you're in this artificially lit room at 70 degrees 24 seven, your body doesn't know what the hell is going on. This is why a warm shower is a good indicator for your body that it's time to sleep, as we've been saying. And the ideal, the optimal sleeping temperature, the eternal monogamous debate is over, people. 65 degrees is the optimal sleeping temperature. Assuming you have a blanket, obviously, 65 degrees, you're going to fall asleep and stay asleep optimally. (laughs) And the coolest way they found this in the book, the best study, arguably, they did in Matthew's lab, was they made a sleep suit. So think of like a Spider-Man suit. It's skin tight, but piping through the suit is a vascular system of water. So it's just like a body soup with artificial veins. And so they were able to put someone in this for a night's sleep and they would pulse hot water through the hands, the head, and the feet of the suit so that your core body temperature would drop. And then throughout the REM and NREM sleep cycle, they would move the water around so your body temperature would give you a better night's sleep based on all the water that was rushing around your body changing the temperature it's just like that study we learned about the people would hold on to electric rods to amplify the nrem pattern in their sleep for a better sleep quality and here maybe in the future we'll be wearing sleep suits that would be pretty damn cool but let's be real here if there was a bunch of warm water rushing like down your chest around your pelvis and your groin you're telling me you wouldn't piss the sleep suit (laughs) <laughs> I would happily be sleeping in urine if a bit. <laughs> Alright, I'm going to stop myself there before I admit to wanting to defecate myself on, <laughs> on recorded audio. Move it along. Ending this chapter about iPads, factory whistles, and nightcaps. The snooze button. The snooze button. I'm coming after you now. We learned it in first grade, people. You snooze, you lose. And that applies in sleep and in real life. Hitting that snooze button in the morning. I've seen some people who every minute they have an alarm set, every five minutes they have an alarm set. This is just continuously assaulting your cardiovascular system, starting and restarting the day. You barely fall asleep. It's like Thomas Edison's dream machine. But you're just doing it to torture yourself. It takes a lot for your heart to break you out of this mini coma every night that is sleep. It gives you a tiny adrenaline boost every time that you wake up from slumber. And so you don't want to waste it. Not only do you not want to waste it, but the alarm clock, you know, you usually woke up to a rising sun, the human being, not this. So your body gives you this tiny adrenaline boost. And do you know what the adrenaline boost is? The fight or flight system? cortisol which is the stress hormone so it's good to have a little bit of cortisol shot through your blood through your blood frame you're like oh my god what's happening what's happening stress 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 let's go and you're ready to go you're ready to start the day but if you do it again and again now your brain is starting to pile up cortisol so you're starting your day in an anxious mood So you want to have this tiny hit of cortisol a couple times throughout the day. You want that fight or flight to go off. Maybe if you're in a confrontation with someone or you see a creepy guy come around the corner, you need that little flip in your stomach. (laughs) But to give it to yourself 10 times before you wake up and start the day, you are starting the day at 10%. And at a 10% where you think the whole world is out to get you, you're in for a day of hurt. So you can use this little release to your advantage in the morning or you can use it against yourself. Same thing when you drink coffee. Caffeine increases cortisol. That's the stress hormone, so it gets you amped up, ready to get some stuff done that you've been thinking about, the things that you've been stressing over. It'll get you to focus in on those, just like methamphetamines and Adderall. Same thing, higher dosages. They're all part of the amphetamine family of drugs. So caffeine also increases the cortisol. That's why some people's skin breaks out when they drink caffeine. And so... When you're hitting this alarm clock, you're literally milking your amygdala and waking up in a panic when you should be flushing it out. And that's just like every time you wake up, you wake up in an anxiety attack. (laughs) It's a terrible one of those vortex, the negative feedback loops that we've been talking about. 
and then eventually you're either going to need more coffee or more sleep. They're both drugs, everything. We're bags of chemicals walking around this earth, so modify it so that you're addicted to the best one. This is the best way I could describe it, and Matthew got into here a little bit. And Matthew's suggestions, if you're a chronic snoozer, get one of those alarm clocks that like run around the room in the morning you need to chase around and stop or an alarm clock shredder they have these new things little puzzles rubik's cubes you have to put together in order for the alarm to go off it's tons of solutions the free market has for us so go explore so that you don't start every single morning with a heart attack and that's going to bring us to the end of chapter 13 ipads factories whistles and nightcaps we've got a few left here chapter 14 being next hurting and helping your sleep pattern so for this chapter we're going to be going over all those drug families that i mentioned before talking about how the fda could be crucial in implementing a change in how our society values sleep to save american lives and finally we're going to be talking about working out and eating before bed both not suggested so currently 10 million americans are on some sort of sleep medication that's 3% of Americans are on some sort of sleeping aid medication. And the point of medication is to cure a disease, right? Well, no. Big Pharma uses medications to suppress symptoms so that you always have the disease and you continue to buy drugs. But in Nick's nonfiction ideal world, medication would be to cure diseases. But in fact, when people stop taking sleep medication, you will often experience what's called rebound insomnia. And you sleep far worse than before you ever started taking these drugs to begin with. And that's because your brain becomes dependent on those exterior chemicals to induce sleep. So remember that case we talked about before, if you really think you're an insomniac, you can convince yourself that you are one. It was called hypochondriacal insomnia. And so imagine you just are so undisciplined about your sleep schedule that you go to a doctor and say, I can't get to bed, doc. You need to give me some meds. Your sleep pattern from then on out is never going to be the same because with rebound insomnia, even if you try to taper off these drugs eventually, you're never going to be able to get into that benzodiaphamine induced sleep that you were able to with these sleep drugs. And sleep drugs are some of the most addictive drugs in the world, and that's because they are benzos. They are part of that benzodiaphamine drug family. And you know what else is in the same family as these sleep medications? Massive sedatives like morphine and opium. And opium is the biggest crisis in America today. The opioid crisis kills more Americans than any war we've been in for the past 20 years, all seven of them combined. <laughs> These drug dealers that are allowed to buy commercials during the Super Bowl, they're killing more of us than ISIS who gets 500,000 hits on a beheading YouTube video. So those benzos are really drugs that should be taken in the most extreme situations, like on the battlefield. You don't need to be taking opium to sit in your lazy boy after going to your 9 to 5. It's just this negative vortex that we see. You're probably not sleeping, you're probably not eating right, and now you're probably taking benzodiaphamines at night. So it's a good way to, easy way for you guys to memorize these drugs in the groups. The benzos are your sedatives, your opium, your morphine, your sleeping pills. And then earlier today, we touched on meds like Mrs. Clinton is using and all of our fighter pilots. And, you know, a large amount of kids in high school and middle school and scarily elementary school as well. This is Adderall. This is the amphetamine family. This is the Pro Vigil, the cleaner, and then the cut with sodium, Ritalin, and Adderall. And these are all amphetamines. And you know what else is in the amphetamine drug family? It's obviously on the more mild end of the spectrum but coffee. And that's why you see how addictive coffee is. It's in the same family as Provigil, Adderall, and cocaine. They're stimulants, unlike the sedatives we just went over. So these stimulants, you see, you have a cup of coffee, and if you get to the point where you're drinking multiple cups of coffee a day, you have that, oh, the first sip of coffee of the day, nothing like it. That's addiction. That's chemical addiction. And then the rise can never be as high as that first of the day again. <laughs> so... Over 50% of Americans use amphetamines. Alcohol? Alcohol is ethanol. <laughs> Again, back to the organic chemical makeup of it. It's just a couple atoms off of ethanol, the stuff that we put in our cars to make them go. In America, we found these crazy ways to suck that all out of genetically modified corn. Corn used to be those tiny little things that you have on Thanksgiving thrown in the stuffing, those tiny baby corns. 
that was corn. And then we came over, like, all those pilgrim depictions of them having maize, the, what the natives called it, on the first Thanksgiving. That's fake. <laughs> we didn't have that kind of corn until we were able to genetically modify it and make it the size of a football now. And that's why it's in everything, because it's so cheap to produce. So we feed it to every American like cattle. Corn and potatoes, those are the two weird foods that humans just chefed up themselves and their starches they're not carbs they're not vegetables huge misconceptions <laughs> now we're going over food drug families your starches aren't vegetables starches are the dirty guys on the block but for real stay away from corn and potatoes if you're trying to lose weight <clears throat> and so alcohol is in that family of these foods that's why you bloat when you drink alcohol and <laughs> it induces so many heart diseases and carpal diseases in your joints and things like that as well that's the booze, the alcohol, the ethanol for you. And then finally, <laughs> the drug family reunion, the psychedelics. These are what's been demonized by the government. The cannabis, the mushrooms, the LSD. This is like what merges your REM sleep and your reality every night. And these are not addictive. <laughs> I know you say, oh, what about those wake and bake stoners? They habitualized getting up and smoking like an idiot. When some people habitualize getting up and drinking an amphetamine, which is coffee. See, you're doing a smart drug. You're just hacking your brain better. So these psychedelics are chemically not addictive. So much to the fact that the higher levels, most people don't make it to like mushrooms and LSD. You cannot take them two days in a row. They literally will not work. You would have to double your dose. Whereas you could have the same cup of coffee every morning. <laughs> and you're wondering, why the fuck does this kid know about drugs so much? How much time are you spending in back alleys? I read a book called Trip by Tao Lin, some Asian uh, like internet article writer. So it wasn't that great of a book. But obviously it gave me a lot of really cool information and how these were able to relate to sleep. So maybe we'll do a review of that book in the future. And that's just, a, dude, isn't that just a smart thing to learn about what you're putting in your body and what commercials are trying to convince you to put in your body, what family those drugs are in at the very least? But no, you're just told in dare, drugs, stay off drugs. <laughs> Meanwhile, bad cop, the partner that's not giving the presentation is in the corner holding a styrofoam cup of that straight adrenaline coffee that they have brewing in the detective office. <laughs> It's not that you can really read an easy Tao Lin book and educate yourself about these drug families rather than, like I'm saying, opting into this rest of your life and the world just thinking of drugs as this blanket umbrella, as heroin being the same as CBD. <laughs> but this chapter really just focused on those benzos, the benzodiaphamines, those hardcore addictive sedatives, which are sleeping pills, and how hard and bad it is for your body coming off of those. So don't get hooked on those in the first place would be the easiest suggestion. Use your natural remedies. The free miracle drug that will solve 90% of your problems. Exercise, especially sleep. That's the easiest hack for sleep. Go use your body during the day so it needs to regenerate at night rather than going to sleep as a fully charged battery. In the middle part of the chapter here, sleeping pills, you fall asleep faster, but you have less of a memory of yesterday. And that's because just like alcohol, these drugs surpass REM sleep. So you don't get to unload your flash drive from the night before. All those memories are still piling up in the hippocampus and you can't transfer from short term to long term memory. And while taking sleeping pills, your chance of death goes up the amount you take as well. And you hear stories about executives at large corporations just taking fistfuls at a time. So I mean, but they also have access to the top level cardiologists, which probably have them on a cocktail of like testosterone replacement and vitamins as well drug hard recover hard i guess is their thing <laughs> and while they're taking all these sleeping pills when you <laughs> damn i'm lo <laughs> you can hear my voice is going is leaving because this show has been so long i'm sorry guys if you're coming out of sleep off of these benzos every single morning it, your heart it's not like the heart attack from the alarm clock you give yourself every time you are kickstarting yourself out of a coma you're sleeping like a rock and then users claim to be groggy in the morning and then they use an amphetamine like coffee and then the cycle of benzos to amphetamines a to b a to b starts again so not only do you not remember things when you're under sleeping pill induced sleep but it also does not improve your immune system on the same page i read an article about ibuprofen and antibiotics and how it wipes out your entire gut flora in order to cool down your core temperature so you know when you have a fever your 
temperature is really high and you're hot and uncomfortable so when you take these antibiotics it wipes out the gut flora which brings down your core body temperature so it makes you feel better but of course there's always a catch it doesn't help you fight the cold when you're taking ibuprofen because how does your body the human body destroy invading bacteria and antibodies you heat yourself we just burn it off it's like taking the hot shower you got to sear all the grime off and so when you're taking the antibiotics it's making you feel a little bit better but it's not giving your body the full power to kick the ass of this invader so the article was saying antibiotics will help how you feel symptoms like i'm saying that's what big pharma is trying to fix symptoms not cures and the article was saying taking ibuprofen prolongs the cold so instead of being really uncomfortable and hot for four days you're just prolonging this for two weeks and then hey your nose is stuffy so you have to buy mucinex or, or whatever and you're spending a lot more time at cvs <clears throat> and then mortality rates increased with infection throughout the lifetime so again we see the vortex of no sleep equals bad immune system equals shorter lifespan the example in the book was Star Wars, Matthew Skywalker is, <laughs> is back, baby. He was talking about how Star Wars took 40 years to make $3 billion. So in 40 years, it amassed that much wealth. But the release of Ambien, you know, the sleep medication, made $4 billion in a month. And they're still cashing in on Ambien. So the greatest narrative arcs and tales of all time shown through cinema, Star Wars. It took 40 years to make $3 billion. <laughs> what people consider one of the best pieces of art in our modern society. That only made $3 billion totally. And Ambien in a month made $4 billion bucks. No wonder why there's so much influence into our government and Big Pharma. The numbers here are almost too big to believe how much money they're making. Because, like, through taxpayers, you pay into uh, this insurance. I was talking about the last month at the hospital. Nobody knows how much medical supplies cost because it all goes through government health care. Whereas if it was privatized, people, a business would actually want to keep track of how much they're spending on inventory. And so Big Pharma is just making so much and they get paid through health insurance. Our third of our salaries that's being robbed every year. So it's just this hurricane of money up in the atmosphere just above a, a couple socioeconomic and status classes above us that the peasants that the common folk will never be able to make it to and that's where our money's getting sucked to the top it's how empires die remember remember so there's a ton there's more than tons of money in big pharma and big pharma are in bed with the fda you see the revolving door workers that run gnc i think the old ceo was the like head of the fda of gnc and there's no coincidence that the fda isn't allowed to regulate supplements the uh, so gnc is <laughs> there's a drug dealer in every strip mall in america <laughs> this is why when you take pre-workout there's sometimes 500 milligrams of caffeine in a scoop of pre-workout and there's these people that are using it while they're trying to pr break <clears throat> break their personal records and their heart rate is going to be higher than ever before no wonder people die in the gym every year <laughs> just fucking smoke crack before you come to the gym bro i'm not gonna judge you it's the same thing as going to gnc no <laughs> that shit isn't regulated and now the FDA, they're also in bed with, there's very little regulations on big pharma commercials. This product may induce nausea, diarrhea, heartburn, indigestion, death, blindness, stroke, impotence, loss of family, loss of attitude, loss of personality, <laughs> suicidal ideations. And they're allowed to play that at a million times speed. Yeah, that's fair. All these, just this drug I'm going to take every day for the rest of my life and have my brain rely on. You could say it at a million miles an hour. <laughs> yeah, that's not sketchy at all, but the guy who's hustling out on the corner, rain or shine, just trying to sell a plant, some bud, a fucking plant, he's the drug dealer, he's the criminal, the threat to our society. That's just a grown-up lemonade stand, he's trying to make other adults happy. <laughs> he's not trying to get you hooked on mesothelioma. Oh, remember that callback? How often does your... <laughs> does your fucking weed plug have a... <laughs> have to have a callback? It never happens. <laughs> Man, I used to want to be a nutritionist. I wanted to be the top of the FDA. 
because obesity is the biggest epidemic in america you know it kills more people than all of our wars than terrorism than the scary terrorists we're all eating ourselves to death in this beautiful empire that our forefathers built and we're all shitting on <laughs> so yeah i had to be the head of the fda because you could save more people through educating them than you ever can save in a war that we started for oil so you could save americans lives prolong their lives improve the quality of americans lives rather than convincing them you're keeping them safe from this artificial threat and stealing their money for that instead of i guarantee we could get everybody a personal trainer in america everybody would rather have a personal trainer in america rather than giving israel five billion a month they're being stationed in fucking in libya because nobody knows where that is on a map newsflash it's in africa yeah our military's in africa does nobody see what's happening and now we're going to another continent south america what stuff is only getting more exciting so ending this chapter is a couple ways to improve sleep rather than taking these benzos removing clocks from view is a really big one because you're not obsessed looking over at the clock oh how long was i just having my eyes closed trying to fall asleep check again check again move that out of view don't have this alarm clock staring you in the eye when you roll over on your nightstand exercise i i was talking about before it's the biggest miracle drug it increases brainwave strength and REM sleep so you literally have super sleeps those electrified intense super sleeps after you have a hard workout and so not only is it good for you physically but working out is a moving meditation if you're just listening to music or something you're not really involved in if you're just listening to your breathing you really do clean out those thoughts so good for you working out and you gotta trust the weights, man. The weights don't lie. You never sleep bad after a hard workout. The weights aren't gonna lie to you. They can't lie to you. But sleep has more influence on exercise than exercise has on sleep. So if you didn't get a good sleep last night, you're not gonna feel like going to the gym. It's gonna hit that negative feedback loop when you can turn it to a positive one. It's up to you. So even if you never run, if, you're ne if you never work out or use your body beyond normal transportation, you can do just Indian sprints for 25 minutes. That's walking around your neighborhood and jogging from one mailbox to the next and then walking for five minutes. I guarantee if you try that, you probably won't need your Ambien that night for the first time. And then you'll sleep better and then you're going to want to work out. And finally, you hit that positive feedback loop. It's one of the more beautiful things in life when you look forward to things that are going to benefit you. <laughs> Or you could just look at it as a cynic and say, oh, you're addicted to working out, which is also the truth. Cynicism is truth here because your brain does get accustomed to the daily rush of endorphins. So it is just a chemical addiction working out. And then your brain can't wait to log that positive biological indicator. Oh, we have this new physical activity in the morning that our circadian rhythm can grab onto. Sweet, let's solidify this in memory during sleep. And then your brain gets excited about it and keep wanting to do it. And finally, don't go to bed too full. Matthew was saying you don't want to work out within two hours before bedtime because your muscles, you might still have that pump, which isn't good. Your body has to start to repair. You got to hit that anabolic window, baby. You got to repair some of those torn muscle fibers you just did in the gym and our bodies aren't that good at multitasking. Sleep is about the brain more than the body. So when you're sitting in your cubicle during the day, you're going to be rebuilding those muscle fibers. And so same thing with the multitasking, don't go to bed too full because your digestive system will disturb your sleep and that gut flora can't take the bath. So you're going to, you can't go with your gut feeling the next day. If you got macaroni and cheese in there, who wants to go with them? <laughs> Everybody has a coworker. They think really their brain is just mac and cheese stuffed into their skull. <laughs> and some of those neurons, as we learned, are in your gut. So don't fill your gut with garbage during sleep when you're trying to improve your brain. Also, I think I forgot to mention before about the neurons, but men also have hundreds of thousands of neurons in their penis. That's why they turn into fucking animals when we're sexually aroused. So not that that's an excuse, but the term thinking with your penis is scientifically accurate. <laughs> So there's an excuse for everybody. If you're ever on the stand for sexual misconduct, my penis was thinking for me. <laughs>
<clears throat> if over 70% of your daily and calories come from carbohydrates or sugars, which is most of Americans, you're going to sleep inflamed, which leads to things like cancer, diabetes, and extreme weight gain. So don't eat too close to sleep. That's a hard one for me. Who doesn't love to fall asleep? <laughs> Who doesn't love to put some chocolate pudding in their retainer before they fall asleep? How else are you going to have sweet dreams? So what did we learn this chapter? Get off of the benzos to fall asleep. And again, the miracle drugs, sunlight, diet, and exercise are going to increase the quality of sleep and then the quality of your life. And that's going to take us along to chapter 15. This is about sleep and society. This is it. So this is going to be shifting to moving on. What have we been doing and what can we do to improve sleep? And over the past 100 years, we've cut down on sleep as a society by a third. So this goes along with that Edison we were talking about before we're colonizing the night. We're on average from nine hours down to six. The average amount of hours the American gets is six hours. Think about that. That means half of the people are getting four and half of the people are getting eight. Only like 10% of people are getting the recommended nine hours. It's not very good. That's like most of the kids in gym class failing the pacer. <laughs> But I understand it. There's more to do now than there used to be. There's not five TV channels that turn off at 12. That's what happened in the 70s. I, I just learned this recently. I thought the TV went all night. But no, in the 70s, they turned off the TV at like midnight because they're like, okay, today's programming is over. Listen to what we have to say tomorrow, America. But now we have all the information in the world from all the sources with all the LEDs in our face. So why wouldn't you want to colonize the night? That's why I'm trying to get my hands on this CIA pill that makes it so I don't have to sleep. <laughs> now, there's some sleep studies we have here. Matthew did working with Fortune 500 companies here and CEOs because that's when it gets people's attention. If it means more, mo if more sleep means more money, that's a good way to get people's attention. So Matthew was able to show that in the workplace, time on task does not equal completion. Procrastinating, inefficient work time, just feeling like you need to drag something out. This goes back to bullshit jobs. People could make any bullshit look like it's worth $40,000 a year. And what Matthew showed was that in Fortune 500 companies, sleep-deprived employees were leading to up to a $2,000 loss per head. And then super sleep-deprived employees, so like these four-hour night sleepers we were talking about, were snails. They were losing $3,500 a year. And go into great description how they measured all this in the book. But like I'm trying to make the point, it's just better to phrase it, Matthew, for Matthew going around on these book tours that more sleep equals more money. It's a better sell. But I mean, if companies were smart, they would actually ask you how much you sleep before hiring you because you know a lot of companies pay for your health insurance so they don't <laughs> it's like being a uh, fattest or whatever you don't want to hire an employee if they have diabetes because you got to pay for their insulin every day for the rest of their life well you should really ask them how much they're sleeping because that leads to the biggest myriad of health problems like <laughs> your uh, employee is going to come in with dementia one day because they haven't slept properly in six months and so it's back to the drug war, you know, these companies will ask you, have you smoked marijuana within the past month? <laughs> Instead of asking about benzodiaphamines or if you fucking boozed last night because there's still alcohol in your system then and you are going to work drunk. Been there, done that. So you see, it's it's not even a drug war, it's an information war. That's why... I'm, I'm so pissed that crazy motherfucker Alex Jones claimed the term info war because that's what it is. It's just an information war. Who will educate you first? Because humans are lazy and we don't want to go on and educate ourselves any further. And the government gets to you first through this D.A.R.E. program. And then it just rises up the ranks into the corporate world. And you know, psychedelics are only psychoactive for the determined length. There is no hangover. But with all of these drugs, like even the bent, obviously booze, I'm just saying you can't metabolize booze in your sleep so you wake up fucked up and you go in and use company property, machine, and time while you're incapacitated. Whereas psychedelics are processed throughout sleep and are only psychoactive for the determined length. So isn't that hypocritical that they'll test you for this plant in your system? Whereas, dude, I live in Denver. It's one of the healthiest cities in America. And everybody's getting high all the time. That's because you get high, you get paranoid, and then you look in the mirror and you're like, Oh my god, I'm that fat? Yeah, let's hit this joint and then hit these weights. <laughs> And companies don't even ask if you're boozing, which leads to like a lot of health problems, just like the sleep deprivation and you coming into work incapacitated. 
the type of people that are going to go into work high, though, obviously don't care about their job in the first place. That's like grouping their entire marijuana user population into that wake and bake group. And so that's what Matthew was able to prove through these Fortune 500 companies. There are also studies in value of sleep loss by country. Uh, and the U.S. and Japan are obviously the top two because we're the most industrialized. And Japan is so much worse than us because they have fully embraced this, like, <laughs> singularity, basically. Just living as one form, you know, if someone falls on the subway in Japan, <laughs> there are cases where someone is dying on the ground in, the ch in Japan, but there's just so many people in such a dense area that you keep walking so yeah like they have on there's this honorable word in japan for working yourself so hard that you die and isn't that the ultimate fuck you to have your boss come into your office hey knock knock wow you're in early oh shit nick is dead <laughs> that would be my ultimate i quit just leave my corpse in my cubicle <laughs> damn <laughs> that reminds me there's this fat super fat comic in the denver seed <laughs> He's got to be pushing three bills, and he has this joke about if he wouldn't feel bad about killing himself, the only thing that would make him feel bad is that his roommates would have to lug his 300-pound body out of the room. He does it better. Gotta go see him live. <laughs> but that's actually honorable in Japan to work yourself to death. And Matthew found then in Japan that they're so sleep-deprived that it actually affects their GDP by three percent a year if they honored sleep as a society they'd be three percent richer and matthew's really writing to the other ceos in this point of the book to try to get your assets your employees on their right sleep schedules you know they also found it honorable in japan to be the friend that holds the katana that your friend will jump on to kill themselves seppuku it's honorable if you guide them into the next life so you when you get into group think you start to admirize is that a word admirize really weird stuff <laughs> all right let's go a little bit deep i like this part matthew was talking about sleep deprivation is the most effective torture tool it is one of the most widely used tactics for torture because when you're sleep deprived you can't function and you're simultaneously hallucinating the dimethyltryptamine the dmt leaks into your brain which is very close to ambarbitrol which is like truth serum also very close to molly you hear people at raves you take molly you get really happy and you want to tell everybody how much you love them that's because it's very close to ambarbitrol truth serum dimethyltryptamine and so that's why governments use sleep deprivation for torture it's massively effective you're constantly rolling and you want to tell people all your deepest secrets <laughs> And this is why your friends would start to get all giggly and overtired at sleepovers. You're all collectively microdosing together, so you're having a great time. You think everything's hilarious, you're making new jokes, you're overtired together. And then Matthew also referenced this to classified torture description report how sleep deprivation leads to increased suicide attempts. So you really are not thinking rationally when you are sleep deprived. It even ups the odds that you're going to take your own life. That's some scary shit. Your brain starts playing tricks on you. Also, one of the improvements of more sleep, Matthew found that SAT scores improve with later start times like i was saying before you don't want that creative just woke up brain you have to settle into the fact regurgitation school model brain that we've been woven into and that's two to three hours off of adults biological clock so adults are usually at that point at like the 7 to 9 a.m we're into that factual regurgitation brain we're not groggy anymore but kids are in that groggy stage from 7 to 9 and then are ready to take the sats between like 10 and 12 instead of shaking them out of their bed eh, 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 shove a toaster strudel in your mouth go 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 get to school beep start the test <laughs> yeah that's not anxiety inducing and making people <laughs> perform much worse than they could at their apex that's why a lot of smart kids will lie and say they have adhd so you get unlimited time on the sats you gotta hit those loopholes and then matthew mentioned one of the few public health campaigns that actually helped it wasn't pushed as a public health campaign, and it was the only thing I will ever agree and give the, the Reagans credit for, but it was Nancy Reagan's family dinner campaign he was talking about, and it was because it synced like the family up. These kids weren't shoving their face with junk food right before bed, and obviously it's good for social connections too, which is good for brain, and you're better ready to sleep at night. You have a more full day.
So I can't even give any credit to Reagan here. It was his wife, Nancy. And you see it was such a successful public health campaign. Now, first ladies mainly focus on that. <laughs> Michelle Obama tried to make public school edible, but they're still eating, you know, fucking raw pizza dough with fake low moisturized mozzarella cheese. Just garbage. We feed our kids in these factories during the day. But, you know, we wouldn't have the family dinner campaign problem if Ronald didn't declare the war on drugs to begin with. The kids wouldn't be out in the streets trying to educate themselves on these substances that you have demonized and made even more enticing to children. So really, they started the problem and barely solved it. They screwed us in the long run anyway. And at the end of this chapter about sleep and society, just one chapter left after people was about John Hopkins, the guy who the school is named after him because he invented medical residences. John Hopkins, what an admirable guy, right? Not quite. John Hopkins was a cocaine addict, and that's why he, that's probably why he started medical residences. He was so blasted that he just passed out wherever he was working, and he woke up and was like, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah let's do another bump, and I'll start working on you again. Let's get this shit done. <laughs> And now hot 22-year-old chicks are like, oh my god, I gotta go do my nurse residency so I can pass and get fully approved. It's just because this fucking cocaine addict couldn't get home at the end of the night and spent four days in a row working with his patients. <laughs> so now it's part of our system for good because John Hopkins, great marketing, you know that's that in your brain is linked with medical science. <laughs> when in reality, the guy was a cokehead. But back to that hiring thing, <laughs> people don't even test their... <laughs> employees for cocaine in those drug tests well i mean i guess i would love to have a coked out employee especially if you're in sales you know they'd be <laughs> i'm convinced 90 percent of car salesmen are coked out when they get to you on the lot anyway hey, hey hey buddy what can i do for you today you looking for a sweet ride i'm gonna hook you up you're gonna be on wheels by the end of the day <sighs> That's why, you know, you ever seen those videos of Hitler spouting off? Now I feel like I'm on coke just thinking about it. Hitler spouting off? They were one of the first societies to, well, I mean, Hitler gave it to the SS. He wanted his best soldiers to be on meth, just like how we give our Navy SEALs pro vigil. And it trickled down into the public. So the Nazi, this National Socialist Society was one of the first societies that we saw methed out and look how much they were able <laughs> look how much they were able to do in five years they took over europe that's pretty fucking impressive and <laughs> how much productive you could do when you have a jacked up populace so obviously that's not the answer for a better well-slept nation we don't just want to prescribe everyone these amphetamines during the day and benzodiaphamines at night what we should want to do is go to the library and learn about these cycles of histories repeating themselves and governments corrupting information but it's much more entertaining to spend our night in this digital coliseum the fucking internet where there's infinite videos i can watch a talking fruit a burning duck that is my exact search history and you can see why sleep is slowly slipping s sleep is slowly slipping away from us so let's tie a bow on this a little bit back to the back to john hopkins lesser known fact he went to rehab under a pseudonym that's why you don't hear about it but he was addicted to cocaine which we knew and also methadone so he left that medical residency doing twice the drugs and twice the amphetamines and he actually tried to convince his co-workers to use cocaine in the workplace. Because remember, Coca-Cola used to have coke in it. No wonder the Coke brothers are some of the richest guys in the world. They're the biggest drug dealers. Big Pharma, they're coke dealers. <laughs> they were coke dealers, but they transitioned into processed sugar, which is proven if you've seen the rat studies they give rats cocaine and processed sugar and they prefer the sugar the reward system in your brain is more addicted to sugar going full keto is one of the hardest things you will ever do if you've never given up sugar before your body is so addicted to it you need a piece of bread you need a smarty by the end of the night something so john hopkins obviously didn't learn much even after rehab he was still telling his co-workers to do drugs and matthew's point was that just like mine before, you know, most doctors are in their 60s now. People are looking up to them, but they went to medical school in the 70s and the 80s. And what did they know about sleep hygiene back then? 
this is a very new science so don't look to your doctor as this mystical oracle of knowledge they're just some guy who went to school in the 70s who was drinking banging chicks while simultaneously getting this degree in the 70s that we all still hold them so highly on a pedestal for just like don't look to the media as this all-knowing source of information gotta trust your sources people don't have too much faith in one place unfortunately there are no miracle cures but the internet is the closest thing i've seen in my lifetime to a miracle so I'm sure you could find more information on this miracle that all of us have in our pocket than you can trust some guy who went to school four decades ago for. How much, dude, I went to school two years ago and I'm already starting to forget stuff. Such a joke. I hope deep down what the internet really is, is this little benevolent rogue AI that actually did break out of some government testing facility and it's just living amongst cyberspace and it's making sure that this form of knowledge doesn't fall so that us humans can continue to use the internet and this benevolent AI will not cease to let the integrity of knowledge and truth be corrupted that is a beautiful speech i could be <laughs> i could write our speeches for the first ai president because you know robots can't write speeches so at least that job won't be automated so that's chapter 15 even over this past hundred years we've cut down on sleep by a third and it's a trend we'll probably keep doing that with this new internet and ai so let's just as a society be more aware of this screen addiction and how it's affecting one of our most efficient evolutionary survival mechanisms which is sleep and our final chapter my brave soldiers that made it all the way thank you for sticking tuned this chapter is a new vision for sleep in the 21st century Matthew started by talking about in the age of smart homes, this is the 21st century, individual rooms will tailor their temperature to help you sleep that 65 perfect temperature as we know by now. And it will filter out too much LED exposure before bedtime so that your brain can finally release the melatonin. And with a neuro chip, something like this Elon Musk Neuralink, it will be linked to your smart home. So it will be able to read the melatonin release in your brain and cue the lighting in your home and temperature to start to sink so you will never have to touch a thermostat again. The book talked about how on the ISS, each light bulb costs, drum roll, $300,000 per light bulb, taxpayer money. And these light bulbs are so expensive because they're so efficient because they are able to imitate an Earth Day. It's not this creepy fluorescent yellow white light we've grown accustomed to. And eventually, these light bulbs that imitate an Earth Day will also be available to consumers. But my guess, if it's still 300k per light bulb, it won't be a long time we'll get until we're getting our hands on those. This middle part of the chapter is a cool way to transition towards the end of the show in the book. And what Matthew found through his countless sleep studies was that the less sleep you have, the more sensitive you are to pain which you think is a good thing, you know. I'll know when I'm hurt this this much sooner. But what's good in knowing that you're hurt and wallowing in your own pain? Life is about how much uncomfortability can you tolerate. Life is outside the comfort zone. If you want to be productive, that is. You can survive. You can work a mile from your house. You can. It's not that hard to survive in today's society. But if you want to optimize, like we've been saying, if you want to be productive, life is about how much uncomfortability you can tolerate and push through. And when you're sleep deprived, you're more sensitive to pain. You're a bitch when you don't sleep. <laughs> is my more memorable non-scientific way to put it than Matthew's? Get to sleep so you can fight the day. Make that next day your bitch and wake up at 100%. And a way to get this to sink into people's brain harder is that instead of showing people analytics like all these facts i've been telling you today but facts work for me i'm a numbers guy and that's why i'm putting this out there you know put what you love out there and the people who also are looking for it will find it i know i know this is a formula for other people out there man that's why you just got to keep doing it for other people who don't actually like reading and want to hear some and want to get some yucks in while they're learning that's what Nick's nonfiction is here. So instead of showing people analytics, you can do pre-dialytics, which is like that app I was talking about that would show you your face, what it looked like if you didn't sleep and were so vain that we wouldn't let us slip into the ugliness that we see in the future. There's this app 
that came out with uh, the Truth, that campaign that's on TV against anti-smoking. That has been really effective and resonates with teens in quitting smoking. <laughs> but juuling memes, unfortunately, are more relevant to kids with a good sense of humor than these <laughs> corporate ads. But they say it has proven to decrease smoking. And they also put out the Truth, this app that shows you what you would look like if you smoked a pack a day and smoking just like not sleeping you ages you rapidly so pre-dialetics have proven to work <laughs> so the best tip i could try to give you is every time you put that snap filter on you know that smooths out your skin that's what you could look like with proper sleep hygiene strive to be as hot as you are with the snapchat dog filter on another good idea matthew brought up why don't we have a sleep class in any of public education, even in elementary school. <laughs> Sleep, this activity we spend a third of our life doing, you never get debriefed on anything about it through your public education. And most people, even, it's an, even though it's an activity we spend a third of our life perfecting, most people still suck at it throughout their entire life because they're not given the information on how to better themselves. Just like diabetes, everybody knows diabetes exists since 2019, but you're not going to stop eating yourself into this hyperglycemic state until you're actually at the threat of losing a foot. And still, this doesn't stop a lot of people. You know, they die of, they die of obesity then and heart complications. And so sleep loss also leads to urinary and bowel issues. Remember the hair loss in women and ball shrinkage in men? You know how embarrassing it would be to have to go to a doctor for pee-pee and poo-poo problems when you're much older? Get your sleep while you can. Take care of yourself. Middle part of the chapter here, Matthew was talking about how we leave babies in 24-hour fluorescent lit rooms as soon as they're born. This shit is really dumb and it makes me sad. I worked in a hospital. I would just... A couple times a day, go walk by the window where you could see into the room where all the babies are just lined up. <laughs> babies are lined up like it's an auction. I want that one. But they really were under these creepy yellowish humming lights. Bzzz. Welcome to Earth. Bzzz. Cool. I can't wait to spend 80 years here working to death. <laughs> we were talking about... Um, about narcoleptics before and how they have sleep paralysis and and how those are the stories of alien abductions well maybe that's just planted in your brain from when you were bought into this dimension and the first thing you see is searing white light and an alien with a mask on breathing in your face maybe it's a little better to be naturally boarded to a sunset rather than your nine month old orbitals immediately being doused with leds 24 hours a day sounds a lot like an alien abduction to me <laughs> so let's get our babies to sleep better so it'll continue throughout the lifetime rather than starting on a bad note here again concerning corporation corporations corporations sleep deprivation leads to not only lower productivity but lower morale and then a higher turnover rate. So you're spending more money on these HR positions to go through hiring every so odd months because you have low morale, because no one's sleeping. And so let's try to look at sleep as a public health issue a little bit here before we wrap. The government definitely doesn't look at sleep as a public health issue. They don't look at what Americans do three times a day, what we eat three times a day is a public health issue. Even, dude, when I was growing up, they were teaching the food pyramid. You know what was at the base of the food pyramid? Grains. Produced grains. What fucking Nabisco makes for America. Oh, coincidence there. Google New York Times sugar scientists bribed. Throughout the 1900s, they were being bribed through the New York Times. I have zero. The, the mainstream media, media holds zero credibility to me. And they've been lying since the 50s about what's going into our bodies. We see now people can cure cancer just by going on ketogenic diets. You're not supposed to eat grains maybe at all. These people beat cancer with plant-based and carnivore diets so sad to see what's being pushed on us food isn't treated as a public health issue what kills us most sleep what we do for a third of our life as well as eating the two biggest things we do neither of them are actually sold as a public health issue it's just looked at as substance control by the government and what can you tariff and make money off of and make and arrest people to make money off of private prisons then gross systems get set up when you have these positions of power and influence to be manipulated.
How fucking narcissistic of a thought is that to begin with, the government thinking they can control Earth's chemicals? If people want to get high, they're going to get high. Like we were talking about in uh, torture chambers, they discovered it took torture chambers for them to discover that sleep deprivation causes increased suicide ideation. Even if you're being held in a maximum security prison, people are able to kill themselves. Even if you're held in a maximum security prison, people make toilet wine. You're telling me some fucking guy in his basement isn't going to be able to brew beer, grow pot, mushrooms, LSD, synthesize coke, literally anything. It's just a way for the government to scrounge money. And if you buy into the fact that drugs are the devil, that's when you know they got you real good, man. Because humans are just these walking around bags of drugs that get addictive to positive reinforcement. And that's how we survive. Governments would save millions in traffic cleanup alone from drowsy driving if they just taught classes on how much you're of a risk you are going to kill yourself by getting behind the wheel sleep deprived. And then Matthew got a little bit socialist here talking about these stats saying the government should be able to implement uh, like mandatory sleep hours. But I don't think the government needs to get any more involved. Like we just said, it's about tariffing. It's not actually about keeping you safe off of bad chemicals. I can go on the top of my three-story roof right now and bring my BMX bike and try to start doing backflips. There's a big chance I die doing that. No one's ever died or overdosed from cannabis. The cops will come and watch me try to do backflips on my <laughs> on my roof. They will come and arrest me with a joint on my front porch. They don't care about the safety or what you're putting in your body. They care about making money. It's a business. It's a mob. So no, Matthew, we shouldn't say the government has say over our sleep hours because we have a curfew on us and people think we're free. Kids aren't legally allowed to be out past like 11 p.m. Cops are legally allowed to drive you home if they think you look like a hoodlum in most states. We have curfews and this military cop police force that lives amongst us and we're convinced into thinking we're free. I think the last thing the government needs is a say over how I can sleep. So once again, information is the great liberator, man. It saves lives, prolongs lives. In this case, improves overall quality of life. And what more can you ask for when you're gifted with so few years on this earth? So if you knew how much uglier you would get, you probably wouldn't scroll Instagram till 3 a.m. And the internet is how we get this type of information out. And the podcast is how we will liberate these ideas it took human evolution 3.4 million years to perfect this sleep process <laughs> and we have managed to basically unravel that by a third as a society in a hundred years and this is not a good trend so try to be aware try to be a part of the populace that is keeping yourself healthy through sleep hygiene and how can you do that? Share this with a friend. Nick's nonfiction. It's only growing every month. Harry shit, 7,000 plus followers growing every month. Doing more mics every month. Get on the train, people. And I promised I would do this, so let's run over these really quick. And I'll put the timestamp in the show so everybody can go really quick over the 12 ways Matthew said you can improve your sleep cycle. Number one, being stick to a sleep schedule. Like we learned today, your circadian rhythm is the most powerful indicator in the human body and will keep you sane as you break up this long journey of life into digestible days. Number two, exercise is great. Exercise is the biggest free drug and what you should try out before you get hooked on these sleeping pill benzodiaphamines like Ambien. Or even if you need to get a little boost in the morning, you wake up way too groggy because you didn't sleep well. Exercise will give you that boost of endorphins to get you through the day number three matthew said avoid caffeine and nicotine we learned today how caffeine blocks the adenosine receptors so it piles up in your brain and your brain then can't tell when you need to go to sleep similar process in nicotine number four avoid alcoholic drinks before bed no the nightcap is terrible for you it makes you surpass REM sleep so you cannot unload your USB drive of short term memory to long term memory what you do in REM sleep is not achievable you're wasting a nice sleep and you're probably going to sleep later because you're boozing out with the boys 
Number five, avoid large meals and beverages late at night. Your gut biome needs that bath during the night. So those neuroreceptors in your gut, you can go with your gut during the day the next day. And our bodies are so bad at multitasking. <laughs> our brains really aren't good at it as well. You can convince yourself you are, but you are half-assing one of the two tasks. Humans are not multitaskers and we cannot eat before we sleep if we want to get a proper night's sleep. Number six, if possible, avoid medicines that delay or disrupt sleep. Go to chapter 13, people. That was all about our benzos, our amphetamines, and sleep pills. Number seven, don't take naps after 3 p.m. Fuck you, Matthew. I'll take a nap when I want. I think he's trying to say here, don't get into a sleep cycle before you try to fall asleep because it'll be harder. And those are the 90-minute ideal naps. You can take a 20-minute nap throughout the day. That's enough to give you a little recharge and probably get you to the end of the day if you're not a bitch boy. But do not take one of those full 90 minute naps where you hit the full REM and NREM sleep cycle before you're trying to have a full night's sleep. Number eight, relax before bed. Take that warm shower. It'll draw the heat to your extremities and out of your core so that your body can drop that two to three required degrees in order to fall asleep. Also, meditate. It will improve the quality and frequency of your brain waves throughout sleep. It'll be more restorative. You will have a better version of those long-term memories. Your identity will be more solid. Number nine, ooh, I guess I jumped the gun. Take a hot bath before bed. Number 10, dark bedroom, cool bedroom, gadget-free bedroom. So again, remove those clocks so you're not anxious, anxiously checking them. A cool bedroom, 65 degrees is the optimal sleeping temperature. And a dark bedroom, New York City, your circadian rhythm is probably on Pacific time from all the LEDs that are surrounding you. Get blackout shades. Number 11 now, have the right sunlight exposure. Just like I said, the big three free miracle drugs, sunlight, diet, exercise, sunlight, get the vitamin D in through the day. And the sun has been rising and setting for billions of years. It's the easiest way for our body to grab on to sleep. And lucky number 12, final number 12, do not lie in bed awake. Do not use your bed as the chill place for the day. Do not wake up and spend two hours in bed. Your bed is needs to be a place for sleep and your brain will more easily associate your bed this helps to combat sleep onset insomnia when your brain can easily relate this bed oh my head just hit the pillow this is when we go to sleep boom that's a wrap that's a day we're remembering everything from that day we're optimizing we're getting to the next day about to make that day our bitch so people, that is Matthew Walker's Why We Sleep. Thank you, my troopers who made it through. We had a ton of fun today. I was able to just run through those 12 main improvements on sleep. And doing this show is going to cement it in my brain. Listening to the show will help cement it in yours as many times as you like. If you want to see some funny stuff, go check the show out on YouTube. And remember, your sleep hygiene, everybody. Thank you guys for listening. Keep living it up in April. This is one of my favorite times of the year. April showers. I just watered your brain with the knowledge that is why we sleep. Unlocking the power of sleep and dreams. Matthew Walker, PhD. Thank you for that, man. Cheers. April showers, though, bring May flowers. Next month, we are blooming the idea of a perfect government. We are going over Maury Rothbard's anatomy of the state, analyzing what is a state. We have tried governments throughout human history, and next month, we are going to learn the anatomy of the state. So do not miss that show. I love you guys for tuning in to this show. Shows are only getting better. I'm only having more fun with this, and we're only learning more here on Nick's Nonfiction. I cannot wait to see you next month. Stay golden out there. Love you. Peace.